What's up, you guys? We have a huge debate today, and this is between Dr. Sean Baker, the guy who coined the name carnivore diet and is leading the charge in helping thousands with their health via the carnivore diet, against Dr. Garth Davis, who is the guy in the plant-based space who is leading the charge, helping thousands of people with a plant-based diet, though he subscribes to a vegan diet himself. Now, obviously, in creating this debate and this conversation, I really wanted to find somebody who was of the same caliber level as Dr. Sean Baker and somebody who was as well-respected in their community, and that is Dr. Garth Davis. So these are two Goliath characters who are going back to back specifically with science so we can unravel the truth. And Sean even actually opens up about something on camera that he's never really even said before, I don't believe on camera, which I think is very interesting and important. But overall, we go through about four different topics, which include things like, is fiber necessary? Is the news media bought and owned by a plant-based narrative? Is meat causing inflammation or early death or cancer, things like that? And overall, is there a common enemy? that with all of this confusing information out there and all of this mixed bag of info and opposing views, the two of them can agree on. So I hope you guys like this video. As always, like and subscribe. The bigger subscriber base that we have, the bigger guests on that I can have, and the closer we get to unraveling the truth. I hope you guys like this one. Let's get into it. Guys, I'm super excited to have you both on here. Dr. Garth Davis, Dr. Sean Baker, Excited to have both of you chat with me about the lifestyles and the diets that you promote for people to live the happiest, healthiest lifestyles that they can, avoid disease, and uh, you know, hopefully, have the best life possible. So today's conversation, I have kind of the my intention is to explain why we want to do this in the first place, and it's also very fair for me to state my bias. So I am bi biased towards more of a meat-based lifestyle. I do coach people on that. But the point of having a conversation like this is because I do think that there are so many echo chambers out there, and I do think that um, people lack information because of that. And I want to constantly challenge my beliefs and my understanding of science. And I think that's the point of science is to get two experts in the field, possibly with opposing views, communicating with one another, because the whole point is to have open conversations so we can help people. So I'm absolutely down to have my, my opinions, my beliefs um, challenged. That's what we're doing. Why don't you go first, Garth, and go ahead and explain why you're here, why you're credible for this conversation, if you would, please. Sure. Thanks for having me, Lauren. Um, so my name is Garth Davis. I am a board certified weight loss surgeon and medical weight loss specialist, run several different clinics and, I, clinics, and I'm currently the medical director for the Center for Weight Management at the Methodist Hospital in Houston, uh, where I participate in research and medical and surgical management of obesity. I've um, been studying nutrition and obesity for 20 plus years, have treated thousands and thousands of patients, um, wrote a book uh, somewhat based on my experience and looking very critically at the literature called Proteinaholic. Um, I've also written a book called Expert's Guide to Weight Loss Surgery, though that's probably not pertinent with this uh, discussion. Awesome. Thank you. And what about you, Sean? Yeah. So my background, I was a board certified orthopedic surgeon. I got interested in nutrition part due to my own personal experience with declining health as I got into my 40s, uh, you know, sort of was, I guess, lured into the low carb uh, space based on based on my own experience. And then and then looking at that, uh, I wrote a book called The Carnivore Diet, which obviously advocates for a meat based diet. Uh, I am a chief medical officer and co-founder of a company, Rivero. We are licensed in all 50 states. And our focus is, again, helping people to hopefully use a lifestyle to reverse disease. It's not, a, it's not an exclusive carnivore company, by the way. We use various different dietary and nutritional strategies. Our intention is to publish a lot of clinical research on this. I've been behind the scenes uh, helping to organize studies around this because there's a dearth of studies on this particular uh, cohort of people. I think most of the uh, data that we have you know, just doesn't really reflect what's going on with this kind of a unique and, you know, burgeoning growing population. And so that's sort of my sort of bias. And I've been an athlete my whole life. I've been able to compete at a very high level, breaking numerous world records as an athlete. So I have, you know, I have a, a appreciation for the benefits of exercise on top of just diet. And I, you know, and, and I, you know, like I said, I applaud Garth in at least addressing lifestyle 
as as a very important thing because I think it's under addressed in the modern healthcare system, and it's challenging, and and it's challenging for any physician to to do that. You know, as a busy surgeon, it's it's hard to to, to have lifestyle discussions. It's not it's we're not set up for that. Our system is really broken in in a lot of ways. I mean, we're good at a lot of things, but we do a really poor job when it comes to uh, management of chronic disease in general. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, so just so everybody's clear too, Sean, you're promoting more of a carnivore based lifestyle. I know you're open to other lifestyles, kind of like you mentioned, but more or less, that's kind of what you promote meat heavy right. <laughs> diet sure. for most health. And then Dr. Garth Davis, you promote more of a plant-based lifestyle. I believe you are vegan, but I believe you've been very clear about you don't promote veganism for health necessarily. Um, now I could be wrong about that. Very correct. That's a very big, no, that's a very okay. important distinction. Yeah. Um, so I promote a uh, plant-based, healthy plant-based diet for patients that is not exclusively vegan or vegetarian that does not withhold all meat. So I never tell my patients you have to be vegan. Uh, and the amount of meat we recommend can vary, but it's going to be far lower, obviously, than what Sean recommends. But I don't say you have to be vegan to be healthy. I can make arguments as to why I think vegan is extremely healthy, but uh, based on a lot of data, okay. but yeah. that's not what I teach. But I am personally, personally, I've been vegan 15 years, kind of like Sean. I got, I was 35 and went to get my uh, life insurance policy test because I was about to have a kid and I completely and utterly failed it. Uh, my LDL cholesterol was 195. My triglycerides are sky high. I had fatty liver. I was about 20 pounds heavier than I am now, not at all athletic. And I sat back and said, what has my medical school taught me about this and realized it taught me nothing. And so I really, I went absolutely crazy studying the literature and uh, feeling a little bit like, what am I doing with my patients? I saw a patient the other day, morbidly obese, saw her doctor, and I had the doctor's note, and he puts down there as one of her diagnoses, obesity, and then he put plan, I told her to eat yeah. less and move yeah. more. Obviously, that's not the uh, that's not the answer. And so I went looking, and I'm still looking for the answer. Uh, because it's not so simple yeah. as I think we'll probably yeah, find out. Yeah, uh, if that were working, it would have worked already, right? So it's not, it's not quite there. Where I think we should kind of go next is the rules of the, of the conversation. I'm going to put out a question. I'm going to call out who's to answer it first. You get probably, let's, let's just give it within three minutes to state that so it's not a huge tan tangential thing. Next person can do the same and then we'll just have an open conversation. I have four questions, um, which I think are pretty pretty juicy <laughs> uh, topics really for the plant-based and the carnivore space. Um, I've done this a couple times with different different doctors on, Dr. Chafee, Dr. Ovedia, Dr. Khan, all being parts of this. So this will be pretty fun um, and I think pretty straightforward. I encourage you both to speak as candidly as possible because honestly, there's a lot of opinions about each other's sides that is said in private, but not necessarily as direct. And I think that's important to understanding truth. Um, so whatever that may be, just you know, being as authentic as we can in it. So without any further ado. I don't think you're going to have to worry about us to be. <laughs> I don't think I will. Being either. candid. Uh, you know, it's funny because yeah. when I actually was looking for somebody to yeah. have a conversation with the both of you guys, I got um, some assistance from a friend of mine who is vegan. He's a proponent uh, of this vegan lifestyle. And uh, Sean is very well known in the space, uh, carnivore space. He actually coined the term carnivore diet himself. Um, but then, you know, I, we, I wanted somebody who was kind of up to his standard, at least in, in our space, the carnivore space. And you, Dr. Davis, were, were the name. So you guys are both very well known in your spaces. So just, yeah, you're kind of leading the charges here. Let's be, let's be about it and make sure that we have clarity by the end of this. Um, okay. So the first question that I wanted to ask, I'm very curious about this. Does meat cause harm via, for example, saturated fat or cancer causing causes inflammation and high cholesterol. So realistically, those are the, the causes of eating meat that a lot of people say, but does meat cause harm for the longevity and the, the best lifestyle that one could have? And why don't you go ahead and start this, Garth? This is a very complicated question. So it is not so simple as saying, does meat cause harm? Is meat the reason that we have a lower life expectancy than other countries because we eat more meat? No, it's, it's much more complicated than that. There's so many different things that go into a diet. Do I think meat is a healthy part of a diet? No, I don't. But you have to break down meat into what are the different components of meat. 
So there are multiple different things. We could have unprocessed meat, we could have processed meat, we could have red meat, we could have white meat, we could have fish, depending on whether or not you think that's meat. In order to study this, you got to understand there are different variables that we need to look at. Are we looking at momentary changes that extrapolate to lifelong health? In other words, does it just increase LDL cholesterol and does increasing LDL cholesterol then mean increased cardiovascular mortality? I think what we really need to know, what we really want to know is does meat associate it with all cause mortality? Does it associate with cancer? Does it associate with cardiac mortality, which is our leading cause of death? And are those associations good associations? In other words, is the research very strong for those? I've got a whole bunch of papers laying on this table that I could pull out for you if we want to go into the details. Let's start at this. In order to understand whether meat is a topic that is causing a shortened lifespan, we have to be able to follow people for a long period of time that have been on the diet. Preferably, we would want to follow them from birth, have one group eating meat and one group not eating meat. That's very difficult to do, right? Having a short-term study of five years, how are you going to make an inference really on whether this is affecting cardiac mortality or long-term mortality on cancer? You really need long-term studies. If we're going to look at long-term studies of meat consumption, we're going to have to look at some epidemiology that have followed people for long-term. Now, what people need to understand is, is in order to follow someone long-term and have a good study about it, you need a prospective cohort. In other, in other words, we need to start collecting people and we need to study them for an extended period of time. We need to show that one group is eating a lot of meat versus one group not eating a lot of meat. So if you have two groups that are eating similar amounts of meat, it's hard to draw any statistical correlations. We have to have a mechanism of why we think this works, and then we have to have some long-term results. There have been several studies like this. Uh, my favorite study to bring up in this situation is called the Adventist Health Study. I bring this up because the Adventist Health population is a very interesting population. It is a population that started, they started looking at an event as health one study in Loma Linda, California. Now, the interesting thing is Loma Linda, California is surrounded by a whole bunch of areas with very low life expectancy. The study initially was done looking at tobacco's effect on uh, lifespan. And what they found is that the people in Loma Linda, California didn't smoke. And they also had an ex amazingly extended lifespan compared to the other populations around there. So they started following Adventists for a long period of time. The beauty of it, heterogeneity in the actual people. They didn't have the same genetics. This isn't like we're studying someone from Okinawa that everybody has the same genetics. It's a bunch of different people. They're all in the same environment. So it's not like we can't say, oh, one's you know, associated with pollution or something else. And they have a very healthy lifestyle. They don't drink, they don't smoke. And when you follow them out long term, the only thing that seems to be different is that some groups eat meat, although they eat less than the rest of the country. Some groups eat a light amount of meat. Some groups eat dairy, they're lacto-ovo. Some groups are pescatarian and some are actually vegan. And in fact, they've got the largest vegan population in the entire world. These, this group has been studied now very long term, over 100,000 people, and they've got a very interesting correlation. No matter what you look at, in order to say something correlates, it, it, you want to know it's in a dose dependent fashion. And uh, that means like the more meat someone eats, does, do they get more of the problems? And when you look at the Adventist population, there is a mortality benefit of over 13% from the meat eater to the vegan population uh, and you can pick any disease heart disease you could pick diabetes any of these and there's a stepwise dose dependent uh, benefit towards less meat um, so i really I, we could go over some of the other populations that are out there that have been studied but i i, I really like the uh, adventist meat studies the other studies that are out there aren't really looking at vegan or vegetarian but are taking large populations, for instance, uh, Harvard's Nurses Health and Health Population Studies, where what they're starting to do now is not necessarily say meat, but they're looking at healthy plant-based diet index 
uh, versus non-healthy plant-based diet index. And uh, they're looking at those and, and people with the healthiest plant-based diet index and the most plant protein tend to live longer. In fact, there was a study just came out yesterday that showed shifting from animal protein to plant protein was associated you know with better long-term aging. Yesterday? Jeez, it just came out. I don't know the actual name of it, but it's in the news all over the place right now. Um, it was published out of Harvard. Uh, Dr. Who was the uh, who was the chairman of um, uh, Harvard's nutrition, and uh, they were looking at um, healthy aging. Um, they have a healthy aging index, and then looking at uh, plant protein versus animal protein versus total protein. And I will say this: uh, in my book, I am pretty anti-protein. We could get into why. Uh, I have changed quite a bit over the time that I'm a little bit more positive towards more protein, not excess protein, but more protein provided that it's plant-based based on I some of these studies that have come Does out. Does this look like it? It looks like it might be it. Yeah. Sean, I, I wanted to have you go next, but real quick, we talked about this before, uh, right before this, I think we all had lunch. Um, what did you have for lunch, Garth? <clears throat> I had two pieces of Ezekiel bread, which is sprouted grain. Uh, with some mustard, some hummus, um, and some arugula with uh, sprouts. Okay. sprouts. <laughs> I had bacon and eggs. Um, what did you have, Sean? <laughs> well, it's, I haven't had lunch yet. It's, I'm two hours. Uh, you, you know, okay. I'm in the Pacific time zone. You guys are both central, I believe, and so I'm, I'm still waiting. So I've got two, two New York, New York okay. strips waiting for me. So I'll, I'll have that after yeah. this. So I'm looking forward to it. So, so I think that, um, one thing we have to remember, you know, you, you'd mentioned a whole bunch of different saturated fat driving, you know, LDL cholesterol. And we do, we do see a, a small trend towards that in the general population. There was just a huge, uh, meta-analysis that was done a couple of days ago. Sotomo, uh, David Ludwig, Adrian Sotomoto uh, was a primary and they found that, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in a specific population. These are people that are on low carb diets that aren't eating processed foods uh, that are eating a lot of meat. And in that particular type of population, we see that the biggest driver for LDL increases are in fact being lean. And, and it, Garth is a weight loss surgeon. He knows the value of being lean that generally reduces your risk for diabetes, heart disease, cancer, you know, pretty much every chronic disease gets better when we get leaner. And so in that particular population, we see for some reason LDL goes up and, and being lean seems to predict that. So that's unusual to say the least. It's, it's, it wouldn't be what you expect. In fact, in that low carb population, they found that being obese actually caused that the LDL cholesterol go down. So then you start to say, well, is it better for me to be obese than lean? And I don't think it is. Um, when we talk about saturated fat, remember saturated fat is, it's not just one thing. You know, saturated fat, is it myristic acid, lauric acid, caproic acid, caprylic acid? Is it steric, oleic, you know, on and on and on. So we can talk about what are these different saturated fats and how do they independently affect us? And we also have to realize that in the United States, where does saturated fat come from? If we look at a Western diet, and interestingly, the majority of sat well, the, some of the biggest drivers of saturated fat consumption are sandwiches, uh, dessert products, cakes, you know, things like that. Cakes have, you know, eggs and butter and sometimes dairy products. And really only 4% of our saturated fat consumption comes from whole unprocessed meat, a steak or something like that, or a piece of chicken or fish. And so we have all these sort of dietary confounders that plague all of these epidemiologic studies. You know, uh, the recent study from Harvard that showed that uh, red meat increased risk for uh, diabetes by 62%. Lasagna was defined as red meat. Sandwiches are just defined as red meat. And so I would contend that we're not answering the question that, at least not to the, to the interest of the population that, that I am promoting. And so I'm not, I'm saying what happens when you don't eat sat, you when you don't eat uh, processed food and you're just eating a whole food meat based diet. If I were to say that to Garth that, hey, a vegan diet is Oreo cookies, Coca Cola, vegan cheese, and a couple pieces of fruit and vegetables, he of course would push back on that. And I think this is the same sort of scenario here. And we don't have, we don't really have a lot of studies on people eating in, in the fashion I'm describing, mostly meat based with very little to no processed, you know, ultra processed garbage, which I think is really the problem that we're talking about. There's, there's, you know, very few studies that have that, that would meet the criteria of long-term uh, hard clinical endpoints, not just you know, we've got some biomarker that we, we suspect may be associated with this stuff. And so, again, I would say, I don't know. 
I, I, I will say, I don't know if, if my diet is going to make somebody live longer. I don't know if it's going to either prevent or increase the likelihood of some disease because we just don't have the data that shows that now. What I can say is in the short term, which I do think is valuable, by the way, I think when you have a patient that's in front of you that's sick and suffering, if you have an option to make them no longer sick and suffering, that's kind of what you're supposed to be doing as a physician. Now, the long-term stuff, I think, is at best speculative. Even though we have literally spent billions of dollars on epidemiologic studies, Adventist Health, all the stuff coming out of Harvard, Epic, Epic Oxford, all those studies which are, you know, Nurses Health, on and on, we've spent lots of money on those studies. I don't think they've really shown us that much definitively. I mean, speculative at best, and again, it doesn't describe the population that I am concerned with. I think what Sean is, and actually, Sean, I, I, I applaud you. That's, that was a very, uh, I, I agree with your position in that we don't know. I, I think Sean's relating to when he brings up Soto and, and Ludwig study. Ludwig has come up with this concept of certain people are hyper responders to the increase in saturated fat and low carb diet, but it doesn't matter because they decrease their triglycerides and they decrease their HDL. And does that protect them long term? And the study that he brought up, there were, it, it, that became a big uh, topic with letters to the editor that came back and forth. And there was a pretty interesting discussion. I, I mean, first of all, in that study with the hyper responder, th that the most overweight people, so the, the idea was the overweight person goes on a low carb diet, they don't get as much of a rise in LDL cholesterol as someone like Sean. So Sean might go on a carnivore diet and his LDL goes up. Now, does it matter? Look at Sean. Does it matter if Sean's LDL cholesterol goes up? Does that make him unhealthy? He feels good. He's setting world records. Does that make him unhealthy? And that is a probably pretty essential question for us to answer. Now, in that study, there were obviously, as most studies, I mean, we could point out study flaws all the time. I think that probably bores people, but there are some important parts. The overweight people in that study, usually overweight people have high cholesterol. Uh, that's what I see in my daily practice all the time. Usually they're on statins to protect them. They did no, and I mean no, control for statins in that uh, study with Dr. Ludwig, which was a huge problem. A large part of that study, most of the participants that was in that meta-analysis came from the Diet Fit trial. The Diet Fit trial was done by Gardner out of, San Diego, uh, out of Stanford, and he specifically limited saturated fat intake. So while these people were on a low-carb diet, they were not on a high saturated fat diet necessarily. In fact, some of the studies in that meta-analysis uh, did not even state the amount of saturated fat. So whether there's a saturated fat cholesterol, whether that proved that there's a hyper-responder effect is questionable. But that's out of, I think, what most of your listeners are concerned about. I think the central question and the really interesting question is someone who has high LDL but is otherwise healthy, are they at risk because their LDL is elevated? That is a very important question. Because well, I mean, I think a couple did, things that? on that particular soda motor study. I mean, they did have individualized the IPD, the individualized personal data on about a third of the population, and they did actually there was a there was a there was a chart in there where it, where it talks about statin or no statin in there. So that, that is there's one of the figures there. There's like a cluster of four, uh, you know, BMI versus LDL curves, and one of them talks about, I believe, statin. If I'm not mistaken, I think I saw that. So, but I do agree with your point, Garth. That is there this hyper responder study that is that is protective, and and I will be the first one to can say I don't think we know yet. I think we need more data before we can make those claims. And I, you know, just. So, you know, when I talk to my, my patients and the people that I talk to, I never tell them to ignore LDL cholesterol. I say at the very least, get some imaging and follow some imaging over time to see if there is a risk for you. Because, you know, I think the, 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 the sort of speculation, I'll just call it speculation at this point, is that if you have a low triglycerides and you're not diabetic and you have low blood pressure, you don't have any evidence of, of, of uh, hypertension and you're lean, maybe, maybe that LDL is not as a, as a, as a relevant risk factor. Uh, Mortensen study, the Western uh, Denmark study, where they showed that if you have zero CAC score, then the, the likelihood of progression to one of these so-called MACE 
major adverse cardiac events was independent and not related to LDL cholesterol. So we are starting to see that maybe there's some populations where they do have the tendency to develop heart disease and, and cholesterol becomes very problematic for them. Maybe there's this, uh, this, this sort of outlier population, which the size of which is unknown at this point, and it may be driven by people going low carb uh, and getting good exercise and losing weight, and that may be protective. We don't know the answer to that yet. I don't think we do. Yeah, I mean, we don't, but we've got things that could tell us the risk. Now, I think if you're telling someone there's a risk, right, you got a patient, you say, look, these are the risks, and you're having a risk-benefit analysis, then you're doing the right thing. There's problems. So that Westermark study was kind of interesting. I was fascinated by that study. What's so, it called? It's Mortensen you know from 2022, but, I believe. Uh, um, Mortensen 2022 study. Yeah, I think I sent it to you. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it was Western Denmark Heart Registry. Um, and uh, it, it's a pretty cool study that's been discussed quite a bit because what happened is they looked at people with LDL cholesterol, but they looked at them in light of their coronary calcium score. And so what they found was if you've got coronary calcium, your LDL hands down yeah. may, has an effect on whether or not you have a coronary event. Uh, and so obviously if you, if you go and get a coronary score and you've got calcium, you should not be getting an elevated LDL. But what they found out is that this association between LDL and heart disease totally went away if your coronary score was zero. And so that's what Sean's saying. It's like, what if you've got someone that comes in and their coronary score is zero and they're going on your carnivore diet and their LDL cholesterol is going up, but they're lean and their triglycerides are okay, are they safe? Now, there's, a, there's some important factors. If you look at the, the Western Denmark study that you got up right there, there are some different age differences. I don't know why they don't discuss this. This is the problem with, with research is that you really have to kind of dig yeah. into the weeds on it a bit. Um, because when you look at the different ages in the two groups, uh, there's a considerable age difference. So uh, the group with the low coronary artery score was in their, I think it was 53. And then the group with the, uh, that, actually had coronary artery plaque mm. was 62. Um, so we've got, <laughs> we've got about a 10 year difference. Well, plaque forms over a 10 year. So you could say that those 53 year olds may have formed plaque when they got the 62. Follow up is only five years. So, you know, five years is really not enough to tell us with heart disease, whether or not they're gonna have a cardiac event. And then the last thing I'll tell you is that when you look at studies like the Mesa study, about 30% of people, or maybe even more than that, maybe uh, I think it was a third to a quarter of people in the Mesa study, uh, which is a large American population study, uh, where they looked at people with uh, coronary, with cardiac events who had a coronary score of zero, uh, they attributed to about a third to a one third to one fourth of the uh, populations that had a heart attack. In other words, just because you have zero coronary uh, calcium doesn't mean you don't have plaque. So you could have an atheroma, like a plaque in the beginning of a plaque inside your vessel, and it hasn't ruptured yet. So I don't think we could necessarily look at that Danish study. I, look, I think the best thing would be if we had a group of people, a large group of people, and we followed them that had, you know, varying LDL cholesterols, and we followed them for many years, and made sure that they didn't have any other diseases. And this is exactly what they did in the Cooper Clinic in Dallas. So in the Cooper Clinic in Dallas, they enrolled, I think, 30,000 people. They followed them now 24 years. They had varying degrees of LDL cholesterol, but they did not have elevated triglycerides. They were lean. They did not smoke. They did not drink. They exercised. So it's the kind of people we're talking about. If you look at the results on this, if you look at the graphing on it, I don't know if you want to look up the Cooper study there. Uh, Amit Kara is the, it's the Cooper longitudinal study. The interesting thing is in the first 10 years of follow-up, you don't see anything. So in the first 10 years of follow-up, the different LDL cholesterols really had no consequence at all on cardiac events. 
But when you start following it out 20 to 30 years, you start seeing a humongous difference in the different groups. They based them on LDL of 160 to 189, and the lowest group was less than uh, 100. And the difference in uh, mortality at 30 years was highly, highly significant. I think it's a 60% reduction in mortality if you kept your cholesterol below 100. So those are the kind of things that, that concern me. We can make, we can come up with this, this idea that there could be a hyper responder that doesn't get sick because their LDL cholesterol is high. But the problem we got to note is that this is something we need to follow over a long period of time. Not yeah, I don't disagree yeah. with long-term follow-up to, to say that. I, I do think these studies need to be done because there's, I mean, whether you say it's bad or something, there's people that are doing it regardless. And I think we need to know what the results are because, I mean, I'll, quite honestly, Garth, I talk to a lot of people that do ketogenic, low-carb, carnivore diets because they get a health benefit. They, maybe they've had Crohn's disease and it went away. And I asked them, hey, what if your risk for heart disease has increased by 50%? And you know what 99% of them people tell me? They say, I don't care because I feel better now and I don't wanna yeah. go back to living like I did. And I say, you know what, is it reasonable for you to take a lipid lowering drug? I, I, I literally tell them that that may be an option for you because we don't know the answer yet. At the very least get imaging to follow up so you can continue to follow this every three to five years. Um, I think that, and again, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't have the, the, the Mesa study in front of me that you, or the Cooper study you showed me in front of me. But my question would be, during that 20 year follow-up, did those people remain lean? Did they remain metabolically healthy? And I don't know if that data is available. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Maybe it was just on baseline data and we don't know what happened. Was, right, so we don't know what they yeah, did over time to run those so risk that. factors. Yeah. So that would be a question I would have. Now, uh, the other thing is, you know, uh, Matt Budoff, who's done this Feldman study, you know, this, this lean mass type of study where they, where they, where they showed the preliminary data, people, 55 year old average age are on a ketogenic diet for five years on average, their LDL cholesterol is, you know, ridiculously sky high, you know, compared to the Miami heart, they have the same, same number of, uh, plaque score, basically a total plaque score based on CCTA. And, you know, people are saying they're going to run it for a year. They've got they've actually got funding to run it out three to five years, I think. So they'll have a little bit longer data. Matt Budoff is, you know, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Thomas Dayspring, one of the you know, leading lipidologists in the world, basically acknowledges Matt. Yeah, you know, he, he acknowledges Absolute Matt Budoff reading, as yeah. an expert in plaque progression based on CCTA. And that's what a lot of these pharmaceutical companies will use. They'll use a six month trial, a year trial to right. look at pra plaque progression when they're developing the latest you know, PCSK9 him or something like that. So they say it's good enough for a drug trial to get it cleared by the FDA. And they're using shorter windows with that level of precision with CCTA because it's more detailed than say a CAC score or some of these other studies. Now, some people say, well, you're not, you're missing subendothelial plaque because you're not doing an uh, intravascular ultrasound. But realistically, there's no studies that show that people just develop massive stretches of subendothelial plaque and it doesn't go into the luminal. Usually it shows if it's going subendothelial, it equally is going intraluminally. So we're getting intraluminal data, which I think is significant. And I, you know, again, these studies have not been published yet. We still have to wait for, you know, I'm not out here telling people, I mean, I don't, I, I know, you know, you see some of the social media goofy side of me. You don't see what I'm telling people day to day when I talk to people. And when I tell people, we don't know yet. And so I would be cautious if your LDL is high, consider lowering it. If you don't want to do that for very, maybe you don't want to go into drugs, maybe you don't want to change your diet, then at the very least, serially image what's going on until we have more data. And I think that is a reasonable approach. I'm not some, I don't, I don't want to have heart disease. That's what I do for myself. I had a CAC score when I was 51, it was zero. I'm going to get another one probably this year. Hopefully it'll still be zero. If it's not, I may change things. I'm not, I'm not married to this. This isn't an ideology for me. And like you, I don't tell people, you know, you don't tell everybody to go vegan. You tell them, hey, you know, reduce your garbage. I'm sure you're telling everybody to reduce the garbage and the sugar and all the added oils and things like that. Eat a healthy plant-based diet. And if you want to include some lean chicken breasts in there, go for it. Likewise, I tell people, try carnivore. You may want to add some fruit, some vegetables, things like that if it works for you. And I think that's, again, we just disagree on how much meat's in there, right? I think that's the main disagreement here. Yeah, and I think for the listeners, um, 
Budoff study is really interesting because so we're talking about CAC score. So uh, yeah, CAC. I mean, CAC. Yeah. It's yeah. such a funny sound. So that's a calcium. Yeah. So CT uh, imaging, you're looking for calcium plaques. So now this is a a, a pretty mature type lesion, right? You've got a calcium well, but, plaque. But, it's it's been calcified. So it's at but least realize Budoff study is not CAC. It's CCTA. It's angiography, right? Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Right. That's what I was going to play. Right. Right. So I just was trying to explain to people that um, Budoff's is much more advanced because now what they're actually looking at is if there's an atheroma that isn't calcified yet. So their calcium score could be zero, but you could have the beginning of a plaque starting to go into the vessel, but it's not yet calcified. So you could pick up something a lot earlier. I think Budoff's study will be really interesting. Um, Nadolsky kind of came up with the idea of the study and Budoff is somewhat wrong with it. Nadolsky has been a little bit upset because they're looking at some very short term work. Like you mentioned, we need longer term well, with that. Well, but I do I mean, think I, it's, yeah, they, yeah it I mean, I, I, I know quite a bit. I, I, know all the, all, I literally know all the authors of that study. And, and Spencer didn't come up with the study. He was asked to participate as a yeah. collaboration of dissent, right? Right. And, and uh, his concern was that they were excluding people with significant cardiovascular disease as based on a CCT, on a CAC score. And they actually excluded only one patient for that. The actual number was one right. patient was excluded. And they were actually excluded for another reason. It just so happens that they had, they had a high uh, CAC score. But they do have patients that do have some plaque in there. So, they're, I mean, they're, 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 a lot of them have zero. But there is, I think, 45% have a, have a total plaque score between eight and zero. 45 is maxed out. You know, they, 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 look at, they look at 15 segments, and they grade it from zero to three, zero none, three severe. So the max score you could get is three times 15, which would be 45. So their top guys have about eight, which is pretty consistent with the Miami heart study, which is another healthy population, which they, which they, you know, they cross match the best they could. And so right. we will see if those people that have plaque either regress, progress, or stay the same. And I think we might even see some regression in there, which would be, cause I've seen that. I seen that anecdotally. Now, again, I can't claim anything because it's all anecdotal, but if we start seeing regression of plaque in these people with LDL cholesterol 400, that's going to be, in my view, sort of eye-opening. I, I, I would imagine you would agree with that. That would be so eye-opening. I wanted to chime in on this really quick, too, because this is something that just, to me, is sort of one of the bigger questions in my mind. Kind of like what you were saying, Sean, with like the personal experiences that everybody has of just feeling better. The reason I eat mostly meat now, I never used to ever. Like I used to, I, I actually used to have an eating disorder when I was younger. So I didn't eat much of a lot of things, honestly. But I, when I started to eat more meat, I felt full. I've looked better. I had more energy. I was, you know, I just, I don't know how to explain it. I was all around better um, in every way. And so that's what got me going into um, getting more interested in this lifestyle. And then I started learning about it and understanding it. And then I started seeing that other people were feeling better. And anyways, I, I cured my, an eating disorder with this lifestyle. And I tried everything prior to that. Now, granted, I was having a lot of processed foods too. So I, I hadn't removed those before going to this carnivore lifestyle. But my question is, you know, why isn't there more interest from the plant-based community in this carnivore lifestyle or an animal-based lifestyle? If it's working for people and if it's helping them, why isn't there more curiosity as to why? Because like we, sure, we have science, we have studies, we have all these things, but it's not, a lot of things aren't working. Like we, our heart disease is like skyrocketed, right? So to me, it's confusing because it's like, why do we get so stuck on ideologies and why aren't we looking, why isn't this kind of a conversation happening more often? Do you know what I mean? So it doesn't, does it at all, is it, are you curious about why this might be working for so many people? And also, sorry, by the way, can you uh, just don't click the little, um, the uh, pen, if you would. Yeah, I was picking up on the thing. Pen. I was it too. <laughs> um, the, um, yeah. Okay, so a few things. Why isn't it curious? I mean, a lot of people are plant-based, not for their health, right? So those people are not going to be curious no matter what you show. Uh, they're, this is an ethical decision for them, and that's not an interest. The other thing is you can't throw away data. I mean, we've got a lot of studies. <laughs> I mean, I've got a whole table here, if you want me to start going through studies, that associate meat with heart disease especially, of all things. Now, unprocessed meat 
does a lot better than processed meat. So we could get, uh, Sean brought this up earlier, and it's going to be true on a plant-based diet too. There's a healthy meat, healthier meat, and there's a healthier plant-based diet. But there is a clear, in, in multiple, multiple, multiple studies, showing long-term consumption of meat is associated with our number one killer, heart disease. And this is in multiple different cohorts in multiple different parts of the world, whether you're looking at Epic, whether you're looking at Venice, whether you're looking at uh, uh, Shanghai, whether you're looking, I mean, there's so many different studies. I've got books and, and things on it. So there's definitely a correlation. I don't think you could throw that away. And I don't, I think feeling better is not necessarily the answer. So you could feel better and yet still be sick. I mean, there've been some some, you know, and we've seen it both plant and animal side, but we've seen some very famous people, Charles, Charles Poliquin, people like this that are like big, muscular, six pack abs, drop mm -hmm. dead of heart disease. All right. And, and, and so I don't know that you can necessarily say I feel better means I am better. You could feel better just because you're not eating as much junk food. You take anybody on a standard American diet, I don't care what you do. You put them on a meat-based diet, you could put them on a vegan diet, they're going to feel... Sure. Well, I mean, I think it's food. dangerous to use Charles Poliquin or what was the guy, Bob, the biggest loser guy. I mean, because, I mean, for every one of those headline-grabbing, yeah. anomalous, lean guys that has a heart attack, there's... 5,000 couch potatoes with a big belly. I mean, the cath labs are not lined up with lean guys with abs getting stents. I mean, yeah. we know it's all what we're seeing there. So, I, so sure. I mean, it's just like I could say somebody smoked it's and lived to 100. I mean, great. Yeah. There's people that do that. So to me, that's not, I mean, I think generally people that are generally healthy are generally healthy and they feel good. They look good. They perform well. Uh, they don't have aches and pains. They're not depressed. I think that is a general sign of health. And to say that, well, there's this one guy that was lean that had a heart, heart attack is, you know, I mean, I think that's not really particularly helpful in, in my view. But I think that, yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't disagree, but I think that there are sure, subclinical sure, markers yeah. that we need to look at that may tell us something about the future. I like it's interesting to me with LDL cholesterol and inflammation. Inflammation is kind of interesting to me because inflammation is all over the place, right? Uh, but we do know that there is this idea yeah. of inflammatory yeah. aging or inflammation, if they're talking about it now. And this is the kind of thing that's going to affect you later in their life, but you might not feel it at this very moment. I was looking at a study of Ludwig's, which was another one. So Ludwig's, Ludwig got is a smart guy, right? But uh, he is probably the head keto expert at this point. And he does this study. This was in 2016 done with Evelyn. Uh, and they were looking at increases in protein and changes in resting metabolic rate. And they happened to measure C-reactive protein and it went up in the low protein group. It So did urinary cortisol. All right. So these people are, are definitely under inflammation. They're in their low protein group. And interestingly, in every study he's done since then, they don't measure C-reactive protein or urinary cortisol. Um, was that just a, a bare finding? That aside, because there's other studies showing increases in C-reactive protein. But my question would then be, were those people feeling bad? And the answer is no, those people weren't feeling bad. They were feeling fine. They didn't know that they had an elevated urinary cortisol. They didn't know that their... C reactive protein was higher. They thought they were doing fantastic and they had an increase in their resting metabolic rate. So it's these kind of subclinical things that well, we as you mentioned, C reactive protein is a non specific acute phase reactant and it, you know, a lot of things can drive it up. I mean, I, I you know, I, in my experience, when I see people on a carnivore diet, initially their C reactive protein will go up in, in many cases, but by, you know, two, three months, it's, it's no longer elevated. And so I think it's just stressful to change diets. I mean, it doesn't matter what diet you're going on in many cases. It is a stress on the system. A lot of people are, I mean, we know there is a, a phase where, you know, you go from high carbohydrate to, to, to primarily fat base. There's enzymatic upregulation that has to occur. There's cell type to, that populate the gut that change. Those things take weeks to do. And so some of these studies where we're looking at, particularly these short-term studies, which I am also not a fan of, you know, you do a, like the Netflix twin study. I mean, it was eight weeks. I mean, that's not long enough to make any real, you know, sort of clinical outcome measures. I mean, we're, we're measuring a couple biomarkers, which may or may not mean what we think they mean. So 
I agree with you about the need for long-term studies. Again, they're expensive. They are hard to get anybody to volunteer. Who, you, the best study in the world we could do is lock twins up in a metabolic ward for 50 years, and that's never going to happen. I mean, that's 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 something that we can't do. Right. So we're kind of stuck with these sort of inferior studies. I think the whole field of nutrition is limited. It's not a pure science. We can't we can't just, you know, like an animal, at least with an animal study, you can cut them open and kill them and cut them open in and look what's going on. We can't ethically do that with human beings. We can't leave them locked in cages for their whole lifespan. So we have some real uh, uh, problems with that. This is, a, what is that, a correlation between red meat consumption and diabetes rates? Yeah, so I, I, I'm quoting Nina Teichel. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's... There's uh, a bunch of studies like that. Yeah, oh, I mean, I mean that, okay, that well, study, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, to me, I look at that and, you know, it's correlation doesn't equal causation. We'll see that argument. To me, it's hard to make the argument that red meat is driving diabetes when you see stuff like that. I mean, it's, to me, I'm like, well, why, why don't they at least somewhat go in the right direction? I mean, it's kind of negative correlation. Again, that's not perfect, but probably negative correlation is probably more powerful than positive correlation in my view. It's not perfect. So the way I, the way I look at this imperfect world is to try to do several things. If I'm going to look at studies, typically I want to look at a meta-analysis. More specifically, not even a meta-analysis, it's a systematic review. Because with a systematic review, I can look at a forest plot, and I can see if there's heterogeneity. So if I've got, if I'm looking at a variable, and I'm looking at a forest plot, and there's one outlier, but most of the outliers are saying there's, but most of them are saying one issue, okay, I could say that there's probably some belief in that, whereas if it's all over the place and the heterogeneity is huge. I'm saying, okay, maybe there isn't a correlation. But what I, I usually start, I'll look at an issue. Let's take, we, we could take diabetes. So why would red meat cause diabetes? And there's a, a really strong correlative data here. But we could say, why do correlation isn't causation? But there's pretty strong correlation. So we got to start looking at, it. well, the next thing we got to do is look at mechanistic studies. What's the mechanism? And so the mechanism is that we are basically designed to eat carbs, right? We've got amylase in our saliva. Every cell in our body has insulin receptors and carb receptors, and the carb gets introduced into the cell and is processed for energy. Every cell in our body does that. What happens when you overfeed someone carbs? Do they become fat? No, de novo, lipogenesis is very low. Our body's able to process those carbs or store them as glycogen. Again, these are all mechanistic studies. What happens if you introduce saturated fat into the equation? In other words, I could do a trial. I could make someone insulin resistant in minutes by hooking them up to an IV and injector, injecting saturated fat. In fact, that's what we use. We're about to use in a study I'm doing to create an uh, insulin resistant model. Or more specifically, Kevin Hall did a ward study where he put, he used the patients as their own control and did crossover. And he fed them either a low carb, uh, high fat diet or a plant-based high carb diet. On the high carb diet, they became more insulin sensitive. On the low carb diet, they actually failed their oral glucose tolerance test. And why is that? Because saturated fat interferes with the production of the GLUT4 receptor, which is the insulin receptor that allows sugar to get into the cell. This is all mechanistic. So you could say, this is mechanistic, this is nonsense. But then what if we look at a long-term population study and long-term population studies show that populations that start eating more saturated fat tend to get more diabetes. And then when we start looking at multivariate regression analysis and even meta regression studies, we see an even stronger correlation. And so we've got a mechanism and we've got these large population studies. And that's when I start to put more weight into a situation. It's not just one study. It's this conglomeration. Yeah, let me, of, let me just comment on, on a couple of those things. So the one, you know, the study you're going to do where you inject saturated fat into people's blood and they become insulin resistance, that, that is known. I mean, that is, that happens. We know that when there's more circulating saturated fat in the blood, particularly palmitic acid, that that leads to ceramide accumulation, which interferes with the insulin receptor exactly. and makes it less effective. However, <laughs> The interesting thing is, and Jeff Folick showed this in, I think, a study I sent you, that dietary saturated fat does not necessarily mean blood saturated fat because that palmitic acid that's circulating in the blood is often as a consequence of de novo lipogenesis coming from the liver. So the liver gets the first shot at the food, right? Whether it's carbs or fat, it goes through the portal circulation, which has a you know, gastroenteral, you know, a GI surgeon. I'm sure you're, you're very familiar with that. And so the liver rearranges these molecules and spits them out into the blood. So 
overconsumption, I will argue that overconsumption of fat or carbohydrates or fructose can lead to, you know, de novo lipogenesis, which then downstream. So if you just inject fat into the blood or saturated fat in the blood, you're, that isn't how it works in the real world. I mean, I don't, I don't consume, unless I'm on TPN, I don't consume my food through, uh, you know, through, through my veins, right? Or, you know, and so, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of missing a, a crucial step of what the liver is doing with what we're ingesting. And then the other study, the Kevin Hall study, the metabolic ward study, where they compared a low fat plant-based diet and animal based high fat diet and the uh, low fat people gain less weight and they consume a, a reanalysis was just done by Sotomoda and Ludwig and others. And they showed that they completely misinterpreted the data. They failed to account for a crossover effect. The biggest effect on that study was one was C peptide. C peptide had a bigger predictive effect on who gained more weight. The other thing was the diet order. And there is a, as I mentioned, that three to four week period where enzymes are being upregulated and, and doing, there was no washout period. He went directly from one to the other. So they, they bypassed the washout period, which is a pretty big faux pas. And in fact, Walter Willett actually has, has said that he thinks perhaps that study should be retracted on camera. So it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, sort of sort of scenario. So I want to I want to chime in really really quick here, Garth. Yeah, Sorry, I don't know if it's really... I don't mean to cut you off. Just for the sake yeah. of time, why don't we wrap mm -hmm. this one up? Leave your that's your fine. your last point there in a minute or so, if if that's okay, if that's possible, and then we'll move on to the next topic, which I think does. We've been an hour. We've really been an hour on one topic. So, <laughs> what's that? Yeah. One 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 quick thing, because we're uh, with the IV thing. I don't know if you've heard of the Reseris muffin studies, but we we are probably going towards that. So they did a study on muffins yeah. muffins are kind of interesting because you can yeah. make them with polyunsaturated fat you can make them with monounsaturated fat or you can make them with saturated yeah. fat albeit this is not meat so it's not something that you would necessarily be eating sean but it is palmitic acid and what they did show which is very different than bolic study is when you ate a muffin with saturated fat you did get increased palmitic acid peripherally and more importantly there was a huge increase in fat in the liver in the people that were eating more of the so one group had to eat three saturated fat muffins a day uh, one group three uh, monounsaturated fat three and that you couldn't tell yeah. you know it was obviously blinded they didn't know what they were eating but there was a very very strong correlation between peripheral saturated well fat i mean and, and again you know when we think about you know beef for instance is more monounsaturated fat than it's than it's saturated fat most people don't realize that and so it's again this is yeah. we're not eating yeah, what is? But we're not but it's still high just saturated, saturated fat, fat. I mean, this is a problem. This is a study that uh, that that uh, uh, the the Jack study. You know, the the, the state of the art review on saturated fat and saying that when you're eating whole foods, a steak is just not a bunch of saturated fat. It's monounsaturated fat. It is carnosine and carnitine and choline and all these things that have these, you know, mitigating factors, perhaps. And so we can't just none of us sit down to eat a bowl of saturated fat. No one, no one sits down to eat a bowl of just carbohydrate. I mean, there's all these different things that we have to realize. Foods are different. A, a muffin with saturated fat is very different to me than an egg. I mean, or whatever, or a piece of steak. So we have to be mindful of where that saturated fat is coming to, how it's presented. A muffin is going to have very different uh, physiologic uh, uh, effects than a steak will. I mean, that's that's pretty clear. So like zooming out big picture here, it kind of seems that a lot of what you're saying, Garth, is yeah, we, we see that a lot of people might be doing better short term with having meat, but the long term results are yet to be seen. Right. And it looks like so much of the data out there shows that long term consumption of meat, heavy eating meat is very problematic for people over time. And it sounds like a lot of what you're saying, Sean, is we right now we're there's a lot lacking in terms of what we have for long-term studies with mostly meat diets because that's just how this has been designed um we have a lot to learn but there's also so much benefit that comes from eating meat it's not just for example like the saturated fat that could be problematic there's a lot more to this that's benefiting people um, but plants might also be healthy for people yeah i mean i i'm not the guy out there saying that all plants are killing people. I mean, I, I want to be very clear about that. I know there are people in the carnivore space that say that. That's not me. I, I say for select individuals, yes, sometimes dialing that stuff back is helpful. And I see it just only because I see it clinically on a daily basis. I see people with Crohn's disease and also colitis. And when they cut the fiber out of their diet, they do better. And I can't just unsee that. In fact, there is a case series that Harvard is going to publish on 
inflammatory bowel disease on a carnivore diet. And they're going to show, and they had one, like you said, eating disorder. There's another case series that was published on eating disorders and a carnivore diet. It helps. Yeah. It helps. So again, the question is the long-term stuff. I don't know. I mean, I mean, Garth is operating from a position. The vegan society was formed in the 1940s. If some guy in England started that, they've got uh, American College of Lifestyle Medicine. They've got the Adventist Health Group. They've got Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. All they've got the Kellogg's Court. I mean, a lot of money has gone into studying these things. We don't have that yet. The beef industry has not published a single carnivore study, and I'm actually asking those guys because it's hard to get the money for this stuff. So I'm actually, I was out there in Rogan shaming those guys for not studying this stuff because I think it needs to be studied. Whatever the outcome, good or bad, we need to know this stuff because if I'm going to continue to promote this stuff, I want to have, uh, you know, a more scientific basis. It's starting to happen. You start with case reports, you start with observation, then you do the the observational right. data, then hopefully you do the interventional trials, which we, we hopefully will have a couple of interventional trials on diabetes this this year because I disagree that meat is causing diabetes. I think it actually causes diabetes to go away and not just masking the symptoms where the blood glucose goes down, but reversal of retinopathy, reversal of nephropathy. These are things I'm seeing clinically. So I'm like, how do I not only have normalization of blood glucose, the reduction of medications and reductions in high blood pressure, reductions in nephropathy, reductions in uh, uh, retinopathy? How is that occurring? if this is causing the disease, it doesn't make sense to me. So, so what you guys can see, what I have up right now, um, this is going to lead into the next question that I have. Um, uh, again, being clear about my bias, I'm biased toward eating, mo you know, mostly meat for a healthy lifestyle. So I'm actually asking for your input on this, Garth, for what you're, if, if you have any, just based off seeing this image probably for the first time, maybe, but what we're looking at is just an example of how a lot of people in the carnivore or the animal-based communities, once they find that they feel better, they start to question kind of the studies that are done overall and what the, the source and the funding for those studies is. Um, this isn't pertaining to a particular study right now, but this is with regard to the American Heart Association. Basically what we're looking at is the, the promoters of um, what it says here of high carb diets funded by corporate interests. So obviously that's got a little bit of a slant to it, but ultimately these are companies who give money to the American Heart Association, somewhere between 20 to 50% of the American Heart Association's money comes from these companies. What I'm trying to get at here is the food part up there and the healthcare areas are very confusing for people when with uh, we're talking about the American Heart Association. And for anybody who doesn't understand, the American Heart Association is the longest standing voluntary organization that helps to provide dietary guidelines and guidelines in general to prevent heart disease. Uh, it was established in like the 1950s. I believe it was after uh, President Eisenhower had a heart attack. And I believe at that time, that was when we started promoting, the American Heart Association started promoting Crisco as the better solution for like fat versus animal fat. Up until that point, animal fat was what people consumed in America, majority of the people at least. And so looking at this, we see kind of like where funding is coming from for the American Heart Association. And what's curious about the American Heart Association as an example is they um, they used to say that 300 milligrams a day for uh, cholesterol was like the guiding light. You need to have like no more than 300 milligrams a day. And also that saturated fat was very, very harmful for people. That was kind of why we always had the, for I think it was since the 1980s, 90s, it was like low fat, um, basically don't eat eggs, all that stuff. Well. Interestingly enough, in the last few years, the American Heart Association very quietly kind of like took those off the page, off of their website, but there was no PR statement about that. There was no like, you know, update anywhere. Yet that's the, up until that point, the, the guidelines that they were giving the entire country, what's in schools, you know, what's in hospitals was, you know, low, very low saturated fat, like under 300 milligram, uh, milligrams of cholesterol those recommendations just very quietly went away. And then you pull up these kinds of um, companies that are working with them. And, and so that's to say the, the people in the animal-based carnivore space are very suspicious of why these studies for plant-based, let's say, or even vegan, who's funding them and how much that matters. So the question is, is the news media bought and owned by plant-based narrative? 
And if so, is there proof of this? Examples might be well, let me okay. Let me just respond to this chart because, I mean, I buy meat from Costco and I see they're on there. There's there's Whole Foods on there. So they do. there's there's people that supply meat to the to there. Uh, so I'm not like, mm -hmm. oh, my God, it's all carbs. You know, honestly, I mean, I see the drug companies on it. And, and, you know, a lot of studies are funded by drug companies. A lot of they don't often they don't open source their data a lot of times. So we have. I'm more concerned about the drug companies than, than, than the fact that, you know, big broccoli is, is paying the, the American Heart Association, to be honest. But, but I mean, but I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, it's a problem. There are conflicts of interest. There are ethical conflicts of interest. There are financial conflicts of interest. Uh, you know, I, I think it's rife throughout, you know, medical research. I think it's rife throughout nutritional research. It is a problem. You know, do you dismiss completely on face the data, I don't think you can quite do that, but you can at least have a skeptical eye and you want to see independent reproducible studies done multiple. And, that, and you know, like my view is if I'm the guy putting out carnivore studies, you'd, you'd be correct to suspect that I have a bias there because I do. I mean, clearly. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that we have to, uh, you know, be mindful of is the fact that there are still good researchers that are doing good data. You can look at some of this. I mean, a lot of people point to the NIH because it's supposed to be unbiased. I'm not sure how completely unbiased it is. I will say that Garth can pull up a bunch of studies just because they've been funded. And, and again, if you've got Adventist Health, you know, they're, they're a multi-billion dollar organization. Uh, you've got, you know, other companies that have said, hey, we think this is the right way we're going to fund the studies. And we know that studies that are funded 83% of the time, they agree with whoever funds them in a lot of ways. So there is some bias there. I can't. I don't think we can ignore that. But I mean, again, you don't, I mean, at the end of the day, you still have to look at the data and the day I don't discount what the data says. I might say, well, they didn't ask the right question or the group they're studying isn't the group I'm concerned with. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> there's no, um, like these groups, there's no, so funding American Heart Association isn't funding research, all right? Research, like when I go to do a research study, I've got to get independent research funding. I don't get it from American Heart. You get it from National Institute of Health. So these are NIH grants, uh, or a lot of times you go to private um, funds, like uh, uh, people create funds, like I'm trying to get a private fund from a private group right now. Um, in any good study, if you look at the study, it'll say funds were provided by, but the group had absolutely no influence whatsoever in design of the article. I think Sean probably hit on it. When I look at, when I look at bias, uh, more times I look at the researcher than I do at the actual study uh, of who funded it, because oftentimes us researchers have way more bias from a personal standpoint than the industry going in. If you want to look at money spent towards research, beef check. Do I? No, I do. You know yeah. beef check off I definitely is? do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you do, but but I'm just saying, saying Lord. So beef check off is huge. Uh, so every meat industry provides money towards a basically a beef marketing program, and they actually will fund many studies. Lane Norton, who I, I think is, a, I, I like Lane Norton a lot. Uh, we, we've argued many times. I think he probably hates me, but he's, uh, he's, uh, he's um, uh, I think, a, a pretty solid in the middle guy. Uh, and, and just about every study he's ever published has been funded by beef. When you look at the studies that I quote, whether it's Adventist Health, whether it's a Harvard Nurses Study, whether it's UK Biobank, whether it's the Global Burden of Disease, None of those have got independent funding. They're all government uh, funded by a variety of researchers that have no interest. What's They're not vegan. They're not meat eaters. They're just like, what's the answer to this really big question? They're more interested in getting tenure than what the study shows. There's a reason that saturated fat ha has been argued. And that, that's because, uh, in fact, there was a huge World Health Consortium recently that looked over the saturated fat data and said without any slight, even possible retraction, they are doubling down on the fact that saturated fat is related with heart disease. And they're basing it a bunch on metagenetics. Now, 
randomize do you know what mendelian randomization is lauren i don't know how i do well but if you wouldn't what mind share but like really there's this make it simple for everybody yeah so it's it's not a simple concept so it's hard for people to understand but we say that ldl that saturated fat causes a rise in ldl and that ldl causes heart disease now there's been this recent thing in fact one of volex studies said now undoubtedly saturated fat is not associated with heart disease okay so even the Cochrane study says saturated fat is associated with heart, heart disease. So how does Volick say that, L, that saturated fat is not associated with heart disease? This is where funding becomes an issue, and this is where bias becomes an issue, okay? So the biggest study on this ever was, this started the whole debate, was the Siri Torino study. Siri Torino study, I think 2012, the whole debate over what 2014, Sorry. somewhere around there. And they, uh, the debate over whether saturated okay. fat causes heart disease. Because that's been the, that's been like, that's been, if you ask any cardiologist, the, yeah. oh yeah, saturated fat, heart disease. And, and so Siri Torino said, wait a second, let's look at saturated fat and let's look at heart disease. And they did not find an association with saturated fat and heart disease. And this was a meta-analysis. Okay, how is that possible? Well, one simple thing that the average layperson wouldn't understand, but a researcher would understand. And it happens with something called controls. So if you're trying to decide what causes heart disease, you want to take out independent risk factors of heart disease. So for instance, obesity is an independent risk factor for heart disease. So you're not going to have in your group that you're studying really overweight people. So they move really overweight people. But here's a catch. They took out all the people with high cholesterol. So they controlled for cholesterol. Now that's a problem because saturated fat causes heart disease, not in and of itself, but because it raises cholesterol. So if you're taking out the fact that saturated fat raises cholesterol and you're taking out those people where it raises cholesterol, what you're left with is a genetic group of people that aren't as affected by saturated fat and they don't raise cholesterol. And now you could say saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease. It's called over-adjustment bias. And it is wrought throughout the research. I could easily create a study where I create over-adjustment bias. The other thing I could do is I could create a study where for, there's a study called the Women's Health Initiative and it was a kind of a low fat versus low carb type look. And when you look at it, the, the, the control group that was supposed to be eating higher fat had something called a Hawthorne bias or basically a healthy user bias, or they, they wanted to impress people. So they actually ended up eating less fat. We wanted them to eat a certain amount of fat. They ate less fat. Meanwhile, the group that was supposed to eat less fat, the actual experimental group didn't drop their fat very much. And so control and experimental group ate almost the same amount of fat. So you can't draw any conclusions from that, and yet they do. The conclusion they draw is the low-fat group didn't have a difference. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that bias? So there's these all kinds of these biases, and really what we need is a randomized controlled trial. But how do we do a randomized controlled mm -hmm. trial that lasts a lifetime? Enter metagenetics or, or uh, Mendelian randomization. What Mendelian randomization says is there's certain peep out there, people out there that have certain genetic predispositions. And they may have a predisposition, for instance, to have very high LDL. So they are basically randomized into having high LDL. There may be a group that has a genetic predisposition to having very low LDL. And in fact, if you really want to get into the science, we could look at specific receptors that drugs specifically look at. And you should look at the, uh, the Medellin Randomization um, Consortium. Uh, but we could go to specifically the receptors. We could say the, the receptor that PCSK9 is affecting does have a genetic randomization process where some people don't make that receptor, some people do. And what we have found just undoubtedly with Mendelian randomization is that if you have a high cholesterol level, you have a higher rate of heart disease. And Mendelian randomization has driven that home. And it's also driven home the fact that the mechanism of actions, the saturated fat to LDL, is a driver for our number one killer. So Mendelian randomization has been a very strong driver towards keeping saturated fat in the recommendations. Now, the reason they've gone quiet on cholesterol is cholesterol doesn't affect cholesterol very much. So eating cholesterol, we used to think, affects cholesterol levels. Now we know it's mainly saturated fat. Now, if I eat an egg, my cholesterol level will go sky high. If Sean eats an egg, it won't. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that it's not a linear progression. So at a certain amount of 
there are saturated, there are uh, cholesterol receptors in the gut lining and you can saturate those. So if you eat a lot of eggs and then you do a study and you give these people five more eggs, they're not going to raise their cholesterol very much. And most of the public eats a pretty good amount of cholesterol. But it's a kind of a long winded way to say there are reasons for the saturated fat and it's science. It's not industry. Uh, this has nothing to do with it. There is no big carb industry. Well, there's a sugar industry that uh, affects that pays for um, studies, but there's no big broccoli. There's no big kale. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, there's there was, big so processed food. I mean, you look at Nestle and Conag, you know, De Danone and all there's these big companies. And these processed Nestle, foods, yeah, yeah, yeah. in many cases, yeah. and we know there's studies that show that people that tend to eat more plant based tend to eat more processed food. Uh, that that is known, and so you know the yeah. the, 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 the the sort of the the sort of the perhaps you know goal might be to get people to eat more processed food by having them cut back on eating meat because we know what happens when we when we remove butter from the diet people eat more margarine when we remove meat from the diet they eat more they're not unfortunately they're not eating lentils and beans they're eating more processed food that's just what happens and there's some market uh, forces that want to drive that in my view mendelian randomization studies are not bulletproof there are some flaw there are some concerns around mended you know how many how what is genetic defect actually do uh you know we, we you know we've talked about with pleomorphic aspect uh, uh 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 effects of statin drugs for for a long time you know it's like is it is it ldl reduction or is it you know inflammation reduction that's been going on so there's uh you know there even though mendelian randomization studies kind of cut through some of the confounders that we have and, and just like you mentioned over uh, sort of over accounting for confounders, you can under account for them. You can basically design a study to show whatever you want, depending on how much weight you give to these different confounding variables. Uh, you'd mentioned they in that Santorini study they, they excluded the overweight people, but again, the study that the, the meta analysis of randomized control trial that Sotomoto just put out there shows that in in a low carb case, the people that are the leanest have the highest cholesterol, right? So this is kind of backwards to what we're excluding. So I would argue again, who are we, who's the population we're talking about? Are we talking about the general westernized diet where people are obese and insulin resistant? And yes, probably eating more fat, more calories, more saturated fat is going to drive higher LDL. And perhaps in that situation when they perhaps are oxidizing it more likely and that's leading to cardiovascular disease. I mean, it's funny when you talk about a lot of meat because the average American, like beef, for instance, the average American, we have about 52 pounds a year. That's, that works out to about two ounces of beef per person per, per day. That's not a lot of food. That's a very small amount. I mean, two ounces would not even get me across the room. Uh, and so when we're talking about 70% of our diet come from processed food, ultra processed food, two ounces of beef is, is not significant in that case. And in fact, most of the saturated, like I mentioned, most of our saturated fat is more, more dairy than anything. I mean, there's more dairy consumption there certainly is straight up meat consumption and most of the meat we're eating is coming in the form of hamburgers and hot dogs and lasagnas and prepackaged meals and things like that so again again very different populations so sean with this you, you have a kind of a theme on your social media where you talk a lot about just this food industry and how it's bought and owned um, in a lot of different ways um, I'm going to pull up just an example of one of these is just one of your more recent videos here. Um, and you don't need to go <laughs> right. into like a so full I'll, thing. I'll just put the caveat, was, but the, I am the, the social media is kind of for entertainment purposes only in many ways, you know I mean? I'm, but anyway, what am I saying here? I don't know. Which... Well, sure. And I mean, it, I think, you know, regardless of whether it's for entertainment or not, obviously there's kind of a shock factor to a lot of things, right? But you're putting it out there what you believe. So ideally you stand behind it, which I know you do. You knew it was corrupt, but it's worse than what you thought. Do you recall? Yeah, I think so. I mean, so again, uh, we, we, you know, Garth brought this up, Kevin Hall metabolic ward study. You, you look at the press coverage that study got, right? That study was CNN, you know, you know, Fox news, 90 news outlets picked it up. You know, you can look at it on the altmetric score, which tells how the impact that the study has had the reanalysis, which basically, you know, may lead to the ret ret retraction of the study has gotten the reanalysis, which has had zero, zero media outlets that have, that have covered that, even though it's got the same, the same altmetric score, even though people are just as interested in this study as the other one, but the, the media has decided we're not going to talk about this, which is kind of, kind of an interesting uh, uh, 
sort of dichotomy. You've got one that is pro don't eat meat versus one that's saying, wait a minute, that's wrong. And one gets all the media coverage and one doesn't get any. And so I think that is, I mean, that's kind of interesting to see that. I mean, so the, I mean, the study, all right. I, I mean, it was NIH funded, right? So this is not like a, and Kevin Hall is a, I mean, Kevin Hall invited me to barbecue one night. This is not a vegan uh, proponent. And in fact, he's still not a vegan proponent. He's very, I don't, it's weird because his interpretation of the data is not necessarily pro plants at all. Uh, him and I got into quite an argument the other day online uh, because he points out the drop in A1C in the uh, meat eating group, which doesn't mean anything to me. They were eating less sugar, so they're going to have a drop in A1C, but they were more insulin resistant. This regardless, I don't know that your listeners really care about this, but this is not a biased guy. This is about one of the most respected nutritional researchers in the world doing a study that was about as well controlled. I will agree with you on one thing with this yeah. study is I wish there was a washout period, but he just couldn't afford to have these people leave the ward and come back. And because they had what what um, Ludwig wants to do is and look at the data of whether or not the way the study was organized is there were 40 people, 20 people started with a low that, carb, man. 20 people started with the plant based and then they switched. And what the study didn't do is say, how did the switch affect? And so that's what Ludwig's trying to do. In other words, if you started with a carb, with a high carb, and then went to a low carb, is that different than if you started with a low carb? Yeah, and what, and what they showed was a about a threefold and, difference more than the effect of what the study showed. So, I mean, it, it, it was impactful and significantly impactful. And that's why they published the, the, the reanalysis. And I think it's something that says, hey, maybe the conclusion. Have they sent that? Have they sent that to the letter? To the no, I mean they published a study. That. I mean I they, they right published now. a study that was published that was all over the all over Twitter. Uh, you know, the altmetric score was exceeded what the Kevin Hall altmetric scores. And I'm not sure, Garth. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure you're familiar with altmetric scores. It's a, it's it's journal impact factor. And yes. the second study had a had a greater altmetric score. More people are interested in it, but zero news coverage, which is just it's just interesting to see that. But on that, Sean, really, can you just very clearly, like for people who haven't seen that, that video, what, what did they, what was published and what was not published is what you're no, getting they're Both studies were like published. The point. initial study that Kevin Hall, and I don't discount that Kevin Hall is a good, well-respected researcher. So is David Ludwig, by the way. David Ludwig, because I, I know David. I talk to him uh, not infrequently. In fact, I'm helping him to organize another study. Um, but he will not take any industry funding. He is like, I will never take industry funding. He wants to be as pure as a driven snow uh, in that regard. So he's a very ethical guy. And the initial study that Kevin produced got a lot of media hoopla. I mean, it was well, you know, it was talked by all these media outlets. That study was published in 2021. The reanalysis was done just at the end of 2023. And, and quickly, what, what did that study show in 2021? So it people showed understand. that people that were on a plant-based low-fat diet lost more weight than people on a Mm -hmm. low-carb, high-fat animal-based diet, right? Well, actually, the, the the animal group actually lost more weight, but all of their well, weight I, was lean mass. None of it was fat, whereas the well, plant-based group I'll have to look at the, lost the, more the, fat. the results. But it was basically plant-based. Yeah, plant-based tended to be better on that on that outcome for whatever metric we we're looking at. However, the reanalysis showed it didn't really matter which diet you ate. It, it mattered what diet you ate first because if you ate low-carb first – you had a better outcome because there's a carryover effect. So this, that's why you have a washout period. That's why you wait a month or two months. Uh, and so whoever ate, whatever diet went first was the one that ultimately showed the best results. So if you went low carb first, you, your overall results were better. If you went high carb first, your, your results were worse based on, you know, weight gain and C-reactive, not C-reactive protein, C-peptide levels. The C-peptide levels actually predicted very clearly what the weight gain or weight loss was going to be. C peptide is a proxy for insulin. We make for every molecule of insulin we make, there's a C peptide molecule that, that goes there, and it's it's considered a better marker because insulin is often sequestered in the liver and it and it's metabolized very quickly and doesn't hang around very long. Whereas C peptide is a much better marker for that. So, so the reanalysis basically what I'm saying is the reanalysis got crickets, whereas the initial study got 
all kinds of fa- fair, you know, fanfare. And it was like, is there a, is there an inherent bias by that? Is it, you know, Okay, so you're saying that the initial study where it was in favor of plant based is one that got republished basically after the secondary study came out, whatever. No, I just got more media later. coverage. And, got it, and, and in media, fact, it was interesting when the second study came out, when the reanalysis study came out, an additional 30, 30 media outlets picked up the initial study and still didn't cover the, the reanalysis, which was very bizarre to me that they would, they would re, re-engage a study that's two years old, you know, and not talk right. about the you know, the, the reanalysis, which I thought was weird. I mean, again, I'm not, I, I don't really want to dwell, dwell on conspiracy theories and this sort of stuff. I mean, I think Garth wants to stick to, let's just talk about the science here. Um, I do think there sure. is, I think there's more support for plant-based in general. I think people think we're going to save the planet. We're going to save some cows. And I think that's, there's some bias in that, you, you know, even in the, in the dietary guidelines they are starting to let that creep in. What's better for the, what do we think is better for the environment? And I think that's unfortunate because I think nutrition should be nutrition and there should not be some ethical bias to that, which I think, I think unfortunately there is in many cases. Yeah, that's a tough one. So I, I went, I testified at the, um, a few years ago at, for the USDA for the dietary, uh, guidelines. Uh, I was flabbergasted yeah, at the sure. amount of lobbyists at that thing. There were a handful of doctors and the rest was just lobbyists. And it was very full of, of meat, dairy, and egg. I mean, it was a huge meat, dairy, and egg uh, con- constituency. I mean, it was, it was, it was uh, really amazing. Um, and this goes way back. I mean, the whole dietary guidelines, if you go back to, uh, the McGovern era where they yeah, had the, uh, you know yeah, about when he the said McGovern I don't have time to make decisions. Committee. I'm, like, I'm not a researcher. I don't yeah. have time. Senators have to make a decision right now. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Can yeah. you, can you share what that it, is? So basically what this was is they had the Senate had a select committee. Uh, basically they started out looking at malnutrition. They wanted to look at malnutrition in America. And they found that we didn't have a lot of malnutrition, but we had overnutrition. This was the time where heart disease was just soaring. And they held the series of um, committee meetings and they were very contentious. And it was a very good example of, of industry getting involved. And meat, dairy, and egg were huge, uh, but so was sugar. So was um, the sugar industry. Um, and basically they recommended, they, they made some pretty, I thought, very decent recommendations. They said we need to eat less meat. You might not think that was good, but they were they were pretty good about not getting into the weeds of like saturated fat or this or that. But the meat industry got really pissed at that. McGovern was from North Dakota. He was voted out. They stopped talking about, they basically made it where you couldn't make any recommendations on whole foods. You could only make it on the parts. This is where we started getting into macronutrients because we stopped talking about whole foods and we started talking about macronutrients. And this is where the whole low fat craze came. So this is where they, they, they said, okay, we should eat more, but it should be lean meat. And people said, what are lean? What is lean meat? Well, it's low fat. How do we get low fat? All of a sudden you've got Nabisco low fat snack wells. Uh, and that's how we, we never went low fat, by the way. We never went on a low fat diet. We said we did, but we just ate more processed food as Sean alluded to earlier. Um, and that kind of really messed up, I think, our nutrition discussions. But there is definitely bias. There are uh, senators getting taken out to dinner by different food organizations. I don't think in the world where Sean and I live, there's a lot – like, there's no big plant lobby. Most of the lobbies are for, for big companies that are making processed. Types. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree okay. with that. And, yeah, I think McGovern was from South Dakota. Just <laughs> – I know that because – I know that because I'm dealing with the state South of South Dakota, Dakota to get some funding, yeah. and they said they want to make up for their knucklehead McGovern because they felt like he 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 kind of caused some problems. So it's interesting, but yeah, well, he yeah, caused sure. problems yeah, for sure. ranchers. Trying to say, hey, look, we think we've been vilified unnecessarily, and I, I do, th- you know, again, um, I think Garth and I would both agree that the ultra processed food is is a real problem, and I think where we disagree is probably around meat. I think I think that's a fair statement. Yeah, you know, the funny, I'll tell you one place where I really got shocked with that was, okay, if you look at the Epic database, or if you look at the Heidelberger, these are different studies that were the big studies looking at 
vegans versus vegetarians. So they've got a couple of versions of Epic Oxford. It started out uh, as the Oxford, and then it got taken over by the Epic. Epic was a multicultural, uh, multi-country study looking at diet and disease, but they went and they looked specifically in Oxford because Oxford had a large proportion, not a large, but a, a significant proportion of vegans. Um, Epic Oxford was interesting because if you look at the vegetarians of the Epic Oxford, they, so the Epic Oxford, in just about any study you look at, higher plant-based diets associated with lower colorectal cancer. And uh, that might make sense. Maybe it doesn't to you, but uh, it does to me, except in Epic Oxford. And they started looking at Epic Oxford. Epic Oxford, there's definitely benefits to being plant-based. But when you look, there's a specific uh, study that compares Epic Oxford to the Adventist, because there's a big difference between Adventist health and Epic Oxford. When you start looking at Epic Oxford, and the vegans are getting 25 grams of fiber a day. Uh, that's not much at all. The vegans in the Adventist Health are getting 45 grams of uh, fiber a day. You start looking at sugar-sweetened beverages, there's more sugar-sweetened beverages. If you start looking at all these different factors, you notice that the vegans in the Epic Oxford are not really following a healthy diet. Well, what Harvard did is they said, we, we need to stop this vegan versus vegetarian. We need to have healthy, eating indices. And there's Mediterranean indices, like a scorecard where we take a group of people, we look at what they eat, and then we make a score for, are they eating towards a Mediterranean diet? And they did, they looked specifically at plant-based in their nurses' health and in their health professions. And they said, okay, let's look at plant-based index. Does having a high plant-based index, you know, not saying that you're vegetarian, vegan, but you're eating quite a bit of plants, does that make you healthier? It does, but not very healthy. Okay, well, let's make up a, an unhealthy plant-based index. Now, if you're high on an unhealthy plant-based index, meaning you're not eating meat, but you're eating a lot of processed food, are you still healthy? No, you actually have more heart disease and more risk. Now, what if you have a healthy plant-based index? Okay, now if we did a healthy plant-based index, we're actually eating fruit, vegetables, beans, etc. Now you're extremely healthy and there's a huge drop in risk of heart disease and risk of diabetes. So even in the plant-based world, that's why I get very careful about saying vegan. I never tell people to eat vegan because you, I, I, I run an obesity clinic, I see vegans in my obesity clinic and they're eating brownies and they're eating, I mean, nowadays, uh, you could eat anything vegan that you could eat meat, and uh, that's not healthy. And so I think we do definitely agree that that unprocessed food is definitely Yeah, and, and food you mentioned there's a healthy plant-based index. There's no such thing as a healthy meat-based index, and so that's what I'm calling for. Let's, you know, let's stop mm -hmm. studying the standard American diet and calling a happy meal, you know, the diet that I'm promoting because, yeah, it would. And that would be yeah. fascinating, actually. I would like to see a evaluation – because in any of the healthy eating indices, a lot of times, so Harvard kind of came up with the DASH score. Yes. I don't know if you know the DASH score, Lauren, but basically the the, with DASH, they were looking at. No, that was, a, that was a Harvard diet. creation, okay. and it was actually done. DASH diet, yeah. Uh, they were looking at um, hypertension specifically. So it was a, a diet for uh, hypertension. Uh, and they noticed that people that ate more plants tended to have lower um hypertension. In fact, at the time they said, well, the ultimate diet would be a vegetarian diet, but the key author, um, Sachs, said, well, we can't tell people to go vegetarian. They won't do it. It's too extreme. So let's come up with this DASH diet. They've got a DASH score. And if you look at the DASH score and you look at the data on people that follow a DASH diet that are more consistent with the DASH diet by scoring tend to have lower heart disease and lower hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all of these indices to Sean's point, all of these indices consider meat bad, even unprocessed meat. So there should be an indice, I think, where you're eating a lot of plants, but you get points for unprocessed. Sorry, Lauren, but I can't ever give points for your bacon. Bacon, <laughs> processed meat comes up bad in every single study that's ever been. I, it is so dramatically bad. But unprocessed meat, okay, let's come up with a healthy score that includes vegetables and fruits but has a healthy meat it would be interesting to see how a healthy meat-based index does to a plant-based index that yeah, hasn't the, been done the, there's a lot of controversy around bacon actually within the animal-based community car carnivore community anyways uh, there's a lot of people who are 
for, I mean, Sean, you could speak to that probably way better than well, I Well, I, I personally don't eat much bacon. I think it tastes damn good, but I, I rarely eat it. I just don't even, I really don't want to eat it. I, it's not that I'm worried about it particularly, but I just, I just don't have a desire to eat. It's kind of weird how things change there. I mean, Garth, I would push back a little bit on the, on the process. I mean, there, there have been a few studies. I mean, studies come out of Asia showing that, you know, there, there, there's reviews showing that processed meats don't really seem to matter that much. And I, I know you pushed what you submitted one study. Oh, yeah, I can, I, I, you'd I, have to I, show I, me that. There's, there's a study called, so uh, I think it's like yeah. colorectal cancer, red meat, the Asian perspective. I think that's roughly what the title is. And I mean, granted it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was uh, published out of Korea and they did analysis because they said most of the studies that have been done study Western diets and they don't have as many studies on red meat and Asian population because I think the way the Asian populations consume meat, it's not in the context of hamburgers and French fries. It's probably alongside, you know, maybe a stir fry or something like that. I think that the way they consume their meat is very different than perhaps the way we consume our meat, which is hot dogs, hamburgers, uh, you know, lasagnas and things like that. So, um, but yeah, they, they, they concluded that it didn't matter how much, what the temperature was. It didn't matter what the, uh, uh, that's not it. It's another study. I'd have to look it up. I didn't, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't think about right it ahead here. of time, but it's there. I can, I can find it and send it to you at some point. Um, but no, I forget what we're talking about now. Well, anyway, let's go on to the next topic then. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're just talking about processed meat. So, I mean, processed yeah, I would agree. I would agree that the, the, the epidemiological studies, studies that show processed meat is, yeah, is higher than a non-processed, even the world H WHO's proclamation in 2015 said class one for process class yeah. two for for unprocessed and you know i mean i think there's some yeah. right and the one thing i will say is in the asian studies like the unprocessed meat tends to be associated with cancer and mortality in western yeah, populations so you, so you, you, you wonder why that is much. i don't know I mean, if that's why what is that? to. i mean that's that's a question why do we see these dichotomies yeah. in different populations yeah but that's one unprocessed process. I just I've never seen the and, the and when you could go into mechanistic and we haven't talked much about mechanistic, but it worries. Look, the other thing to look at, which is interesting. I, I don't know. We're going long, but I'm very interested in the aging. Yeah, yeah I'm very too. interested because in I'm aging, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I want to know how not to age. And so this has become a big issue. Now this is a very mechanistic study because to study this from a non-mechanistic standpoint, you got to study a whole lifetime, right? So we got to look at mechanisms of aging. And they're, funny enough, they're looking at dog mechanisms right now because they can study dogs because they have a shorter life expectancy. And the number one thing they're looking at, have you guys seen these crazy people that are getting into right, aging yeah, yeah. and they're taking I, I, rapamycin? I, I, not, right? not for me, I got to tell you. I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, yeah no. good. Not for me either, but, it, well, funny enough, I got the rapamycin because yeah. I was interested and I took it oh. and I got sick. Um, because it is an immunosuppressant, but, uh, and I never get sick. I was like, oh my God, it's the rapamycin, but uh, people, you know, like Sinclair, um, uh, what's his name? Is it Atiyah, Peter Atiyah, 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 Sinclair, Sinclair. Yeah, right. um, Atiyah. So Atiyah has been taking, uh, rapamycin. So how does rapamycin right. work? It works by blocking mTOR and uh works on this mTOR pathway which has become the central pathway that we're looking at aging well, what stimulates I, I, well mTOR? one of the things insulin Lucy. also stimulates mTOR and and calories stimulate mTOR as well a lot of things but so i mean it's it's not just it leucine does. right yeah calories do stimulate exercise stimulate stimulates it but um right. and you want some mTOR otherwise you won't grow muscle but too much mTOR and blocking mTOR seems to be uh, related with aging. And so my concern with protein has been that if we overconsume protein, we're going to overstimulate aging. Now, this is way mechanistic. It doesn't have anything really substantial for us to talk about except for theory. But I will bring up the fact that when you look at some of the mechanistic studies when it comes to meat, I worry about the increasing IGF-1. I worry about the increase in mTOR. I worry about uh, advanced glycolated end products. Because especially with the way you cook meat, you kind of brought that up, but it has been yeah. shown that the way you cook meat can have a big effect. Those nice little grill narks you get on your grilled steak, if you look at them, they've got heterocyclic amines. And in fact, the meat industry has caught on to this, and they're starting to make hamburger with beets in it. And if you eat your meat with some vegetables and fruit, you may be able to counteract these things, which is why I would wonder, Sean, why wouldn't you want to eat 
like some antioxidants to counteract the AGEs? Well, I mean, you know, the advanced glycation end like products, that. there's endogenous and exogenous ones. By far, by far, the endogenously derived ones are a bigger problem, whether it's through fructose, yes. glucose, methylglyoxal. I mean, there's different mechanisms. Uh, Chris Masterjohn had a nice uh, article on that that I looked at the other day. And so... I'm not so concerned about the exogenous ones. And we, and we have, you know, it's interesting, like these, uh, you know, we hear a lot about like sulforaphane and broccoli sprouts and how it's hormetically beneficial to us and upregulates certain enzymes. It's interesting because the way these HCAs and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are detoxifiers, they use the same pathway as sulforaphane and they get the same sort of sort of hormetic stress effects, I think, that, that 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 they do with that. So, I mean, you know, and you mentioned, I mean, most of the data on whether, you know, heterocyclic amines and so on and nitrosyl compounds are bad for us are usually very high dose, done in rodents, in doses that most, you know, I'd have to eat a lot of burnt steak, right, um, to obtain those levels. And so I, you know, you know, if we look at like, you know, you, I mean, we're obviously – Colon, colorectal cancer is a big one with, with meat. I mean, there's some evidence that prostate and breast, but it's mostly been colorectal cancer. But if, if you look at the risk factors for colorectal cancer, yeah, I mean, WHO says 70%, 17% relative risk per, I think, 50 grams of meat or something like that. And then you compare that to other risk factors for colorectal cancer, obesity, chronic inflammation, diabetes, particular inflammatory bowel disease where the risk, the relative risk is like 3,000 fold, Right. And yet I see people that go carnivore. They're no longer obese. They're no longer diabetic. They no longer are you know, exhibiting signs of inflammation. Their IBD goes away. To me, it's like your risk has gone down by, by most of these risk factors. Maybe that 17% that the WHO put out there is what's the net effect of that? So what is the net effect? And I don't know. I'm just like, I don't know. I suspect that getting rid of Crohn's disease is going to protect you from colorectal cancer more so than not eating meat, in my view. But it's, you know, again, as you know, mechanistic things are, you can't rely on those in isolation because there's lots of mechanisms going on. You might have a negative mechanistic thing, but you might have a positive mechanistic thing. Yeah, it, it, it's like I mentioned earlier, it all goes into like a bigger picture. Like, let's take prostate cancer. We've got a mechanism for prostate cancer. Right. So if you look at acromegaly, H- so people that have acromegaly, really high IGF-1, not, yeah. they have a very high rate of having prostate cancer. Uh, and so does IGF-1 cause prostate cancer? Well, if you look at the uh, health profession study out of Harvard, the people that ate the most dairy, and dairy is a strong promoter of IGF-1, they had the highest amount. Of dairy was very strongly correlated with prostate cancer. Now, again, we don't have causation. We've got correlation. And we've got a mechanistic study. Well, then we could do a randomized controlled trial. And so Dean Ornish did a randomized controlled trial where he took a group of people with Gleason 4 prostate cancer. It's an early stage prostate cancer, PSA, I think was seven. Put one on a normal diet where they were eating meat. The other group went on a, uh, a, a vegan diet. Criticism of the study is they also did uh, meditation and yoga and stuff like that. I don't know how that, what mechanism that is for decreasing PSA. But what you saw in the plant case group is a very strong decrease in PSA and a very strong drop in IGF-1. And so now you've got a mechanistic study, a randomized controlled trial, and a large population study. That's how I, I can't definitely say causation, but where there's smoke, there's fire. I'm gonna I'm gonna chime in here really quick with this too. So to to keep the conversation going. So I kind of wanted to just ask some bullet questions um, because I think a lot of people, you know, you get we get in the weeds. It's impossible. Yeah, well, it's to get it's in tough the weeds to answer without things. nuance sometimes. Though. I hate I hate bullet yes I know, or no's because I know that it depends in a lot of ways. But anyway. I know I like to do just a list of questions here just to kind of help people get an idea of what how like how they can proceed because it's tough hearing all of this, you know, and then just being like, okay, now what? What do I do? Right. And so, you know, if you're not, if you're not studying this stuff, it's almost like you just want to throw your hands up and you're like, screw it. I'm just going to eat the burger and I'm just going to eat the fries and I'm going to have a milkshake. Don't do that. Don't do that. Most of us, most of us say don't do that. that. Yeah. (laughs) That's not what we're, neither, neither of us. Because that leads into my first question was, um, I want to find some common ground here. And what I would ask you, Sean, is do you think that, uh, do you think that processed food is one of, if not the biggest contributing factors to why people's health has been uh, 
deteriorating. Well, I, I think, I, I think, you know, there's clarification, I mean, ultra process and processed, I mean, you know, processing can be minor. I mean, cooking is processing for a way. So, I mean, ultra processed foods, five or more ingredients, ingredients that you can't find in your kitchen. Normally it's, you know, things that got weird names, mono and poly, you know, diglycerides and, you know, all these weird, weird ingredients. I think those are problematic. Clearly. I think, I know there's dietitians out there say there's no bad foods and eat everything in moderation. I vehemently disagree. I think there's some terrible foods out there. When you go to the store and there's food that's blue, don't eat it. Right. I mean, it's, 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 it's just ridiculous. Right. <laughs> um, so I think that to my, my belief is that is the major issue. It's driving malnutrition. I think even if we, obesity in my view is malnutrition because we're just the wrong nutrition. I think it's driving uh, food addiction. I mean, these, these, I've talked to people that were formerly in that industry as, you know, food chemists. And they tell me my job was to make food addictive and they know how to do it. And they're very successful at it. So I think you have to find a way to stop eating that stuff. And again, a lot of times it requires elimination, full elimination. And, you know, you can't just, you can't just moderate a lot. Of, there's food that cannot be moderated for many people. And so you got to avoid that stuff. So you, maybe you might say it's less about going full carnivore or going full plant-based. It's far more about actually eating real food that's not ultra Yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly the case. And I, like I said, I'm obviously an expert in a carnivore diet. That's what I promote. That's what I know. I've got experience in that. But if somebody wants to go on a better diet, I'm good. Whatever works for you at the end of the day, I'm, I'm happy to see people get healthy. I'm, it's, my, it's not my mission to eat as many cows as possible. I'd like to see people be helped because we have a sick society, mental health as well. And, and nutrition clearly impacts that as well. And so when we have a sick society, it's just not fun. It's not, it's not, it's not fun to go to a grocery store and see everybody's sick. I don't, I don't like to see that. I'm sure Garth feels the same way. Yeah. yeah Garth, how do you feel about that? Oh, I see. <laughs> I mean, every day I get food logs, right? Thousands and thousands of food logs. And you can't believe what people are eating on a daily basis. It, 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 I read it and I'm grossed out. I have to like stop and be like, don't be judgmental. They're not where you're coming from. But it's hard because you see what they're eating. You're just like, I, where do I even begin with this person? Like we're having this nice little intricacies about what is the long-term study of sex. And I'm looking at a person who is eating ice cream, potato chips, uh, cheeseburger with fries and a chocolate shake. It, it's a totally different scenario. And so I'm starting at a totally different standpoint with my patients. What are key processes? Look, I, and we didn't even get into this. We didn't even get into like the theory on my book was that the, we, I think we speak too much about protein. I don't think we speak enough about fiber. We didn't really get into fiber. Uh, I think people are fiber deficient. We're getting too much protein, not enough fiber. And that drives people to make bad food choices where they choose bacon because they think they need protein or they avoid an apple because they think it has sugar in it. So I think there's a lot of, I would say, nutritional miseducation, but I do think there's a huge problem with ultra processed food, with how cheap it is, how it's subsidized so it's easy to get. I've got families that tell me, hey, look, I got to feed a whole family and I could do it with uh, a drive through a lot easier than I could do. Well, I mean, grocery let me just, so you're, you're so yeah, let me just ex say be, something more because the USDA, you, I don't think the USDA should be in charge of our dietary guidelines, to be honest, because who does the USDA serve? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they serve all these, they serve all these commodities. They've got mixed servings, it's it's right. the rice commodity, the wheat commodity, the corn commodity, the right. sugar commodity, the beef commodity, the, the egg commodity. Explain what you mean. Well, by I mean, that, they, if you could, please. so the, the, we, we talked about the beef checkoff the other because I actually go to the beef checkoff. I went to them and said, hey, fund some studies. And they said, no, we don't want to fund your studies. We think it's a bad diet. Frustrating to me because I like, this is information we need. We need this isolated data on meat by itself. And, I, and, and you know, one of the reasons they says, well, we can't do a diet that disparages another checkoff. We can't like say chicken, you know, beef is better than chicken. We can't say beef is better than sugar. It's against the rules because the USDA has to represent all of the food producers in the country. And so the dietary guidelines mm -hmm. necessarily reflect that. So, and, and what, where does most of the wheat go? Where does most of the corn go? It goes into garbage. And so that's why we get these sort of dietitians saying there are no bad foods, eat this crap food in moderation, which I think is literally friggin' killing people. It's, it's crazy the way this stuff works. Yeah. And I would agree yeah. with that. I can't stand the eat yeah. in moderation uh, that there's some guys on social media 
and they don't look very healthy. <laughs> I mean, at least Sean and I can uh, look like we're walking our talk. Uh, they don't, and they're just like, meet the patient where they're at. Well, the patients had absolute crap. <laughs> the patients, you know, at a drive through, uh, and that's where I'm supposed to meet them. Uh, so I definitely so, agree so with that. So it goes back to that whole argument of like, is, is the food industry, whether it's for plant-based or animal-based, whatever, is it bought and owned to a certain degree right now? We're kind of agreeing that maybe the USDA, which provides a lot of these guidelines might be. In well, I mean, it's ways. corporate capture. Yeah, go ahead. It's more, it's, it is, but it's also, you got to understand we have a very huge farm bill, right? And the, the farm bill is coming up pretty soon. And that farm bill is like any other bill that goes before Congress uh, right. has tons and tons of lobbying involved with it. And when you look at the money uh, and where it goes, so, so the dietary guidelines tell you um, eat protein, lean sources of protein. They, they have their plate, right? So a quarter of it's protein a quarter of its grains, a quarter of its fruit, mm -hmm. a quarter of its vegetables. So you would then think that the farm bill would spend a quarter on fruits, a quarter on grains, a quarter on vegetables, a quarter on protein. And it's nothing like that at all. In fact, fruit and vegetables, the things I really want people eating, it gets maybe 4% of that funding. 30% of the funding goes to the food that then goes to feed the animals. Uh, and again, it's the food that goes to feed the animals that I don't think is the animals you want to eat, Sean. Uh, these are the grain fed animals. Um, and so they're eating the cheap grains, the soys, the things like that. And so most of it, like Sean was alluding to, go, the farm bill is trying to fund the dairy producers, but also the feed producers that feed mm -hmm. the dairy cows. And so most of the food, most of the funding doesn't go anywhere near the unprocessed right. foods uh, yeah, so, that we're so, looking for. Or okay, the so more natural foods. We can agree regardless of what side we're on, right? Plant-based, vegan, or animal-based carnivore is that the unprocessed or the highly processed foods is the enemy. I think we need to have like kind of a common enemy, honestly, to corral people around. And that's, that's something that I think is really important because I don't think, I don't think people get it. I didn't get it. Right. I'm not a, I don't study this like you guys. So maybe y'all got it. Like I, I study it, but I don't know every last little thing like you guys do in the, in the way that you do. So to the general public, it's like, oh, carnivore is going to solve everything. Oh, plant-based is going to solve everything. It's like, well, really what's going to solve everything is eating real food. That's really the, the baseline start. And then we can kind of navigate from there. Would you guys agree with that? Uh, well, I would say that, you know, I mean, I, it, it sort of, sort of makes me sad when I see physicians on social media saying that, Ultra processed foods are the way of the future. There's nothing we can do about it. You might as well accept it and we'll make better ultra processed food. I, I just, I, because the, the point of ultra processed food, in my view, is to make it addictive and cheap as possible. I mean, that's what, that's what the company's bottom line is. And so if you're going to rely on ultra processed food to, to, to provide better nourishment for us, I think we're going to be in for a big, uh, a big disappointment with that. So I do think all, phys, you know, as many physicians that care about this stuff should be saying, yeah, this is probably public enemy number one. We should, you know, I mean, because you think about it, you know, in 1950, 1954, we peaked in our smoking. I think 45% of the population was smokers. It's now down to 14%. So we can do this. I mean, we have the mechanism in place either through government with corporate cooperation to make these type of sweeping, dramatic population health changes and lifestyle changes because we've been successful with smoking. So there's no reason we can't do it. It's just that obviously there's a lot of money involved and, and, when 95% of the people sitting on the U.S. dietary guidelines have industry funding ties, that's a real problem. Is fiber necessary? That necessary for what? Right. Like necessary well, like kind of, die this without is, it? I'm going to just share like perspective. That's a great question. I'm going to share kind of what I think most people, how they think of it, at least from my perspective, is like it's almost it, – I don't think the idea is that you're going to die without fiber, but you're – you, you need fiber to be healthy. So without fiber, you are unhealthy. With fiber, you are healthy. That's when I was growing up, that was my mom's belief. That was what I ate. You have a high fiber cereal, you know, high fiber diet, whatever. That's going to make you have more bowel movements. That's going to make you be healthier long-term and short-term. So um, I think overall in the carnivore animals uh, based space, they kind of say that 
fiber from plants is not necessary um, from what a lot of people I've heard now. I'm curious though, what you guys both think. So Sean, if you want to kind of enlighten, like share more about what the space believes sure. on that. Well, I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody. I can, I can speak to what I believe. I mean, I mean, clearly fiber is not essential for life or I would have passed away long, long, long ago. So it's clearly not essential in the terms that I would describe essential, like, you know, protein is essential. If you don't have no protein, you die. Right. Um, but it's conditionally beneficial. I don't discount that at all. I think that fiber, often fiber consumption is a marker of diet quality, as, as uh, Garth alluded to, this plant-based dietary index. And so if you're eating more fruits and vegetables, you're probably not eating as many cakes and cookies. And I think that's probably where a lot of the benefit is coming from, just what it is replacing. Um, does it have some, you know, you know, individual, you know, does it provide some sense of satiety? Probably so for some people. Does it uh, limit glucose excursions, you know, an apple versus apple juice? Yes, probably so. So I think there's there's certainly conditional reasons why fiber, you know, if you're eating a mixed omnivorous diet, I think you should probably eat a little more fiber than, than, than obviously junk food. What about my population? Again, I'm interested in a very su specific subset of people. And what, what I see, and there are, there, there's a few studies out there showing, I mean, one, you know, study by Tommy Wood, and I, I think maybe I added there, Tommy Wood and, and uh, Lucy Mailer, um, metabolic flexibility of the gut, because we hear so much about fiber and its ability to produce short chain fatty acids, particularly things like butyrate. Well, it turns out that protein can do it, that, you know, being in a low carb state, you have butyrate floating around anyway, and it's, it provides a similar benefit. So I think some of those things are, you don't need fiber for those things necessarily. Um, I think that uh, fiber has been shown to lower cholesterol. And again, this is, you know, obviously, Garth and I d disagree somewhat on the on the value of doing that. But I mean, it, there, there are certain clear benefits to having fiber in the diet. Is it necessary? Does it apply equally to all populations? I would say I don't think that it does. Or I, I'm, I'm inclined to believe that it doesn't. I see people that again, I mean, I'm, I'm interested, I'm not so much interested in healthy people. I'm interested in sick people. And when I get somebody that's got uh, RA or Crohn's disease, there was a study that came out. I, I don't know. That's one on Prevotella. I mean, I, I, there's one on high fiber diets. Yeah. Yeah. High fiber diet exacerbates uh, Prevotella coprae. I'm one of the species of, you know, it's, it's a weird microbiome. The microbiome stuff is so in its infancy, we don't really know what it is, but there is some indications in some people that more fiber actually makes conditions worse. And so when I see those people and they reduce the fiber or even sometimes to none, they get better. One, it tells me, well, it's not necessary. And two, it is conditionally beneficial to lower that. But I think in the general omnivorous pop population that maybe Garth is gonna talk about, fiber has clearly been shown to be beneficial. I don't doubt that. But I think, again, I think there are, again, we're, when we're comparing apples to oranges and we've only studied apples and we've got very little data on the oranges, again, I, I will concede there is not a lot of studies on carnivore and these types of diets. That's why I wanted to get them done because, you know, I see a signal clinically every day that there are some benefits to maybe reducing fiber in some cases. Fiber, I think, may be the most important. But, I mean, it's kind of it, funny, it, it, Garth, funny you say because we can't even really, as digest I was about. it. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's the most important food that we can't even digest, right? <laughs> but see, that's the point. So that's what I was getting to. We can't digest because maybe our most important organ is our microbiome. Uh, I, I'm starting to really fall for the microbiome. Now, we're in our infancy stages with microbiome. We've got an expert at Methodist that I'm working with to, to do some more studies on this. Probably the world's expert on this is Andrew Reynolds and the World Health Population, the World Health Organization asked Reynolds to do a series of men analysis and systematic reviews on fiber and diet. And he did several, one looking at uh, colon cancer, one looking at diabetes, uh, one looking at overall health. You could look up Andrew Reynolds and the World Health Organization series and systematic reviews. Uh, with looking at carbohydrate quality. Uh, I mean, his, his studies, look, it, the burden, if you're going to say that fiber is not good for you, and you didn't say that, Sean, but if you're going to say that it's not necessary, it's not good for you, you're going to have a huge burden of proof because he's put together some uh, pretty good research. And this is like really like skimming the surface of the research. I think what's interesting you kind of brought up, if I'm going to, if I'm not going to be dogmatic, my dogmatic answer is there are a thousand studies showing that fiber is absolutely essential 
for good health. When you look at longevity studies, uh, it, funny enough, you would think fruit and vegetables, I think the average person would say, if we're going to say what food group is most associated with longevity, people would say fruit and vegetables. Actually, mm -hmm. isn't fruit and vegetables. It's legumes and grains. And it may be legumes and grains simply because of their higher fiber uh, per calorie than it is with fruits and vegetables. Um, and I was kind of shocked by that. That's what really got me started with, oh, my God, it must be fiber. Because I was a fruit and vegetable person, not a grain and bean person. Now I'm grain and bean person all the way. Now, if you take someone who eats a standard American diet and you put them on my diet, they are going to be extremely uncomfortable. All right. They will blow up like a balloon right from the get go. And why is that? It's because we're going through different microbiome. Each of us have a different microbiome, almost like a fingerprint. And you can't say it's Prevotella. I mean, there's a general there's a general belief that lactobacillus, bifidobacter, bacter, acromantia are good bacteria, and that uh, the bilophila, uh, watophila, <laughs> they got weird names, uh, are the bad bacteria and bacteroides. And if you got more bacteroides, you're sicker. But the really probably the answer is the variety that you have. And you can build, so there was a study um, by David et al., which is probably the biggest study, the most talked about study in microbiome, which was a study where they put people on a meat diet and they switched them to a plant-based diet and vice versa, crossover. And they showed that within two weeks, we used to think that your microbiome was your thumbprint and you got it from birth. And they showed that you could change it very rapidly. The problem with changing it very rapidly is that you might not be comfortable with that change at the beginning. And it takes time to adapt. So when I'm taking a low fiber person, I don't put them on my diet right away or I will lose them as a patient. It is a slow, gentle progression. And it's not just fiber, but fermented foods in order to change their micro, uh, microbacteria long term, their microbiome long term. I mean, you mentioned... You mentioned um, the Dr. Wood paper, which is an interesting paper. It, now, keep in mind, this is not a study. This is a, a basically a what-if scenario. And he borrows a bunch of studies in there. All of them are rodent studies. So this was a very high rodent study. And I just don't buy a rodent study in humans. But it is an interesting concept. Is it possible? Because it's not just that you need... It's not the microbacteria or the microbiome in and of itself. It's not the bacteria that's important. It's what the bacteria produces. So we know that butyrate, for instance, is extremely important fuel for the lining of the colon. And there's been studies showing that if you have lower butyrate, you have more adenomas. And there's studies showing that if you change the diet to lower butyrate, uh, you could get more atypia in cells. Uh, and we know that butyrate is anti-inflammatory. Butyrate is this and butyrate is that, right? So uh, we all love butyrate and we want cells that produce butyrate. What Wood is trying to say is in a ketotic state, the cells of the small intestine can generate isobutyrate, which works like butyrate, and it could sub that in for butyrate. And is that true in a adult population and my answer to you is the burden of proof is on your side for that there's no studies on it uh if you could prove that that would be interesting but the burden of proof goes that way because the burden of proof right now it's not the burden of proof is not small for fiber it's absolutely gigantic yeah well, uh, i mean you know as far as huge. does beta hydroxybutyrate which is a circulating ketone in our blood convert to butyrate it's one hydroxyl molecule away it does it's very that's a very reversal reaction that's been demonstrated you know time and time again but does it in the does it in the intestine? Yeah, and I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't know, if, I don't know if they've done that in humans. It sounds like they've done that in in animal studies to show that it that it does, and and so we can say, well, you know, it's right. probably good. Good. I mean, what what you know, interesting observations. You know, most of our microbiome in in the intestine is is primarily large intestine. I mean, there's there's some that gets into the small intestine, very little in the stomach. It's primarily we're talking a large intestine phenomenon. That's where most of the fermentation is occurring. And yet there are people that have colectomies that live long, normal lifespans, you know, and they don't even have that. So it's just like, how essential is it if somebody with a colectomy can live to be 80 years of age? And that, that clearly happens. And so I have to say, I think that the microbiome does impact us. How essential is it? Um, you know, I think that the other thing, I, I again, this is just obviously me relaying many, many anecdotes at this point. I see people with 
gastrointestinal issues, whether it's IBD or IBS or gastroesophageal reflex d- disease. And when they they go carnivore, they cut out fiber, they get better. And so, you know, my my perspective on the microbiome, I think at this point, is saying a healthy person has a healthy microbiome. And I don't, I don't. It's hard to put the cart before the horse and say you need to have this bacteroides to this prevotella, blah blah blah. You know, to be healthy, I think it's a healthy person right. by definition will have a healthy microbiome. I think that's a fair way that I look at it. There's so, so much good information in here. I think uh, it's interesting to listen to the both of you guys talk because there's a lot that y'all disagree on, obviously, but I do think that to have the both of you in an open conversation, listening to one another and hearing it, you know, there's probably a lot that over time we could figure out just with your. Well, I mean, I, th- I think from my perspective, uh, we need studies. Every- I mean, I think Garth can point, like you said, he can point to a thousand studies that supports his position. I don't disagree with that. I think he's talking about a different population than, than I'm trying to represent. And I think we need more studies. And I think that's what I'm trying to do, but it's not easy. I mean, it's hard to get money to get these studies done. I mean, and you're swimming upstream right. and even get them through an IRB is tough because people, because you have guys like uh, Chris Gardner, I think it's unethical to do a carnivore study. I'm like, come on, Chris. I mean, there's thousands of people that are doing this. Why don't we study these guys so we can learn something so we can all, you know, maybe, maybe evolve our thought yeah. because I mean, I, I hate to see these, carnivore versus vegan camps where my side your side when mm-hmm. probably the truth lies somewhere in the middle perhaps or maybe some people need this and some people need that i mean i think that's the more reasonable way to go in my view right yeah that that's i would love to see in the future in some way shape or form that we could have that study well i, I guess you know and carnivore. you know because i'm i would honestly like somebody who's in the other camps input in study design that would yeah. satisfy them because obviously the perfect study won't be done. No one, none of us will be satisfied. If you could say, hey, let's, let's have a team of sort of adversaries and say, hey, let, let's design a study that we can all agree on the protocol and the endpoints and what we measure and how we administer the study, and then let the, let the chips fall where they may. And I, I'd love to see, like, in fact, I'm trying to get a, because I think in this specific population, inflammatory bowel disease, I think carnivore would be superior to a vegan diet. And I'd love to see that study done. I'd love to have some vegan cooperation in Inflammatory bowel disease. In inflammatory bowel yeah. disease, have have you seen the studies on? Have you seen the vegan studies on inflammatory bowel disease in the? Um, I, I I haven't. I haven't, I haven't. So I mean, they're pretty. Sure. Well, oh, I, I, really, I think that'd be really, a good one really. to do head to head. I know there's no, been. A, I, I just talked to a phenomenal. researcher from University yeah. of Alabama. He's done a it was Mediterranean versus specific carbohydrate diet in I think it was Crohn's, and about. It was, it was about a third of the uh, the people got better yeah. with, with either. The diets didn't make a difference. But I think I think a carnivore diet would be superior to either of those studies. But it would be fun to do a vegan versus carnivore diet. What do you think, Garth? I think that would be a cool study. I, I mean, it would be fantastic. I, you, the vegan, it's kind of interesting. You can't do the vegan diet mm. in an acutely yeah. inflamed so what do you, so you So you use an elimination diet. You use an elemental diet. They're not going to tolerate right? it yeah. then. So you lose an elemental diet and then you get them to remission with meds and everything. And then once they're in remission, that is when, so in Australia, they took a group of people that were in remission with Crohn's and one group went on a standard diet. Now, standard diet, again, it's not your diet, it's a standard diet. Uh, So it could be a straw man, right? It's a terrible diet, it's a standard diet. But the vegan group had no remission in two years, whereas the other group had 100% uh, remission of their or yeah, so what, lack of remission or return to Crohn's. So this is an and interesting so the vegan group perspective because protected. you say you can't dump a vegan di- diet in an, incru- an acutely flamed Crohn's patient because they'll have problems. And it's my thought that right. why do I see so many people right. that don't tolerate vegetables, right? It's like, it doesn't make sense. They, we've been eating this stuff for millions. There's millions of people around the world that eat this. You know, I think our modern diet has, yeah, I think our modern diet has we so severely damaged our gut function, our, our microbiome, our, our gut permeability to the point that right. somebody who normally should be able to tolerate blueberries is now not tolerating them. And I think I think carnivores are very gentle in the gut. I mean, yeah. that's my that's my sort of hypothesis here. No, there, I mean, there's no there's no doubt. Look, there's a there is a lot of vegans. And they don't, I don't think they approach vegan the right way. Obviously, they call me and they tell me what they're eating. I'm like, oh, my God, you can't eat that way. Or they hear me say that you should eat beans and therefore they're eating like so many beans and then they're gassy. They wonder why. Um, 
And then they go to a carnivore diet and they say they feel better. And so there's a lot of vegans to carnivores. You'll see those all over the place. Likewise, there's carnivores to vegans. So we got them going both way. Um, but what happens with these inflammatory bowel diseases is you get strictures. And if you're eating a high bulky, high residue diet and it comes across a stricture on Crohn's, you're going to have an effect of bowel obstruction. And, and so that's not going to work very well. So in order to do a plant-based diet for Crohn's, you got to never get to Crohn's in the first place. You got to remember like our ancient ancestors, you know, they find, they found fossilized poop, which I find yeah, fascinating. Fecalous, yeah. They have found fossilized poop and been able to, yeah, they have been able to evaluate the poop of cavemen and cavemen were probably eating roughly a hundred grams of fiber a day. And so they probably had a completely and utterly different microbiome than we do now. And there's a big reason, like a, a hardcore, someone who's been vegan a long time, I've been vegan 15 years, uh, and not just vegan, I don't even like the term vegan, a high plant-based diet, you know, I had oatmeal and berries for breakfast, I had whole grain toast with um, arugula and um, and sprouts for lunch and, and chickpeas. And so I could eat a ton of beans without feeling even the slightest bit of discomfort. And that's because I've trained my body to eat that way. Uh, it, it, it takes time to change it though. And that's why I think you see people go from standard American diet to a vegan diet with full foot on the gas. Well, I mean, it's, it, it, well, I just comment because I like to add stuff there because, you know, we, we talk about the fecal list, but I mean, also there's radioisotopic data showing that we ate a lot of meat as, as prehistoric people as well. And so maybe could it have been, we ate both. It could have been one population was eating more fiber than the other, um, heart. Yeah. Yeah. It depends what population. Yeah, you're are you in the Sahara? Or you're, time, in the, yeah. you're not going to get too many too many uh, mangoes, probably. Right. So, I mean, I think it's uh, very interesting on that. Right. And, and I think also, depending on the time frame, because nice paper, Mickey Bendor, Rafi Saltoli, and others about, you know, tro hemotrophic levels, really nice paper. About 80,000 years ago, they, they, they think that we started converting more towards a plant-based diet, which, you know, arguably is enough time to adapt. You know, big, you know, obviously at some point we were primates in the trees eating, eating lots of fruit and then we, whatever, climate change led to the drying of the environment and hominids had to have different strategies and there were, you know, Australopithecus boisei and robustus that tried to go vegan and they went extinct and Homo sapiens ultimately, Homo sapiens sapien, which we are ultimately survived. And so it's interesting, you know, I, I, I don't have a time machine, um, but I mean, there's decent evidence that we... So there are two species called Paranthropus boisei or Paranthropus robustus. There's two of them. They sometimes go by Australopithecus uh, boisei or robustus. And you look at one was called the Nutcracker Man. Yeah. And they had really strong, powerful jaws designed to chew through like twigs and whatever to yeah. get their nutrition. And they just went extinct because it's a, the, the environment would not support that sort of lifestyle long enough. It just, I guess it just got too cold and dry eventually so they went extinct and guys that learned how to hunt kind of survived so interesting yeah it's interesting because there's a lot of people that have different views right they say there's the australopithecus but at the same time there's homo erectus so like that we weren't like one after well we, 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 we yeah they inter groups. they they, they mingle back time, and forth and inter totally inter yeah we've got we've all got some intermittent DNA right, and we've got some some of us DNA. yeah you got zero. I have zero. I got mine checked. Yeah. I got zero. Neanderthal. Really? I, I probably have. I remember I checked mine. I'm probably like fifty percent Neanderthal. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I am. I haven't been checked. Yeah, I was kind of. I was kind of shocked to find I had no Neanderthal. But I mean, it is interesting because it, look, I don't. I don't really. We shouldn't be focusing on what our ancestors ate because we have evolved. Right, I agree We're with different. That. We got to deal with what we got to eat now. I, I do think. I do think these discussions are, they're funny. I mean, like you look at Nathaniel Domini at, well, he's at USC now, I think he's at Harvard. He says that our brains mm -hmm. evolved because of bulbs and tubers. Whereas other people say it's because of hunting tools to in order to eat meat. He said we got most of our calories from, from basically potatoes and onions. Other people say it's from meat. But we can't go back in time and tell who. No, I agree. I agree we don't have a time machine. I'm just wondering where the potatoes grew in northern Europe in the winter. I'm just I'm just kind of like skeptical of that sort of thing. Oh no, they grow. They they go great. They go great in Russia. They're under the ground. They're, they they live. But anyway, that's that's again. I agree with Gart. We got to deal. We got in 2024. We got to deal with the food supply and what's the best way to do that. Okay. Well, I think uh, this might be the start of maybe hopefully 
the the two I hate to say the word tribes but kind of like working together in a sense to to find out some more answers here because it seems that there's a lot of potential answers in the middle that would do well for all of us in our communities to keep an open mind and also to understand that we don't understand a lot and we're trying to learn and you're allowed to change I think we forget a lot in science that science is supposed to evolve and it's supposed to you're supposed to learn more and challenge yourself and you're supposed to talk with other people who have differing opinions and view, views from you to know where your, your blind spots are. And I think that's what we're doing. So just in wrapping, you guys, I'd love to just have everybody know where to find your individual content and information. Garth, why don't we start with you? Where can people find you? Uh, just Dr. Garth Davis on Instagram. Uh, and I do a YouTube Dr. Garth Davis when I sometimes put some stuff on there. I'm not the, I'm not the best on social media. Okay. I'm on well, you got to get a team. I think you have a team, but uh, it's tough. you got to get a team. I got no it's team. It's its own it's job. It's just me. <laughs> I got no team. I got a day job, man. I don't get the team. They'll do it for you. But yes. Okay. Awesome. I'll put that link below. Sean, what about you? Yeah. So I'm, I'm also on Instagram. It's Sean Baker, 1967. I've got a Twitter. Well, it's now X S Baker MD. I've got a YouTube channel, Sean Baker MD. So those types of places. And uh, you know, Lauren is to comment on what you said um, in closing. I agree. You know, I'd like to see more cooperation but i mean we're never going to get all the answers it's, it's always going to be a journey there's always going to be every answer you get leads to more questions so it's you know it's just, it's a never-ending process but hopefully we can help some people along the way 